just to do some housekeeping to to get us started yeah welcome to the um <laughs> gpu and all kinds of um hardware accelerator micro conference um last but not least of plumbers this week um and just as some some housekeeping um of course thanks to all of the organizers and the speakers as well for all of their time and, and making this possible um, to you for joining um, to all of the sponsors of, of LPC um, Facebook IBM um, Microsoft AWS Netflix Red Hat Calabra VMware and the LF for providing all the, the services as well um, LPC is, of course, subject to the Code of Conduct as well. Um, so please make sure you've read the, the anti-harassment policy, um, behave yourself accordingly. And if you do uh, have any issues, um, please feel free to contact either myself on, on Matrix or, or the organizers. And of course, we'll do what we can. So to join in the conversation because this is meant to be more of a workshop style event um, please feel free to to join the audio conference but um, <laughs> we're all used to by now please mute yourself um, when it makes sense um, if there's anything you, you want to ask or anything you're, you're interested in please chime in either interactively through the audio or through the matrix um, chat that we have as well um, you can get to that by selecting the chat option in the left hand side yeah again thanks to all of the organizers and the committee we're not on a break um, but yeah, so we'll we'll be starting today with um, Rob Clark, aka Daniel Stone, um, has been working on some uh, some work with DMA Fence for um, deadline awareness and priority boosting, and a lot of that informed by his work with Fredrino. So, Rob, I will drop my screen. And I okay. can give you the you floor me? as well. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, what do I do to share the presentation? Um, I'm still figuring out this UI thing. <laughs> on the on the bottom um, part of the screen, where you've got the mute etc. buttons, uh, there's a mm -hmm. monitor icon on the right. Uh, actually, there's a take yeah. presenter. Do that. All right. Then you should and be able to share from there. So does this work? Can you see? Hopefully. Not yet. Okay. Um. I suppose if you want, you can try sharing the slides. Uh, or... Yeah, I was just doing that in the background, in fact. Magic pipe wire. Right. Um oh, just there we go. <laughs> yell yell at right. the other me when you need to move it forward. <laughs> All right. Well, hi everyone. I'm uh, here to talk about uh, some work I've been doing on teaching uh, DMA fence about uh, about deadlines. Um, so you can go to the next slide if you want. So first a quick uh 
primer on fences. Uh, I'll just run through this quickly, but uh, most of the rest of this might not make sense uh, without. Um, a fence context is simply an ordered timeline and, you know, such as a GPU ring. Uh, and a fence is a point on an ordered timeline, uh, basically a sequence number. So you know, fence 124 will not be signaled before fence 123 or after fence 125. It's an ordered timeline. Um, a typical implementation for a GPU is simply uh, um, the hardware writing back a sequence number to some location in memory that the CPU can read after all work in that on that timeline prior to the fence has completed and then possibly triggers a uh, interrupt to the CPU if there's something waiting for the fence. So uh, next slide. Um, so one of the first goal uh, and the first thing that motivated me for this was to close the loop between uh, uh, the GPU's frequency governor and uh, VBlank. Um, normally, uh, GPU's frequency governor is based on how much of the time it's busy. You know, it's a utilization-based governor. You know, it's trying to solve the problem of what's the minimum frequency to maintain the maximum FPS, basically. Um, but this, this, it, this approach can get stuck at a uh, sort of local maximum instead of a global maximum. I mean, if you think of it as trying to solve a problem, if it gets stuck at 30 FPS and sees idle time because uh, the GPU is waiting, you know, missed a V blank and is waiting for the next one, that's a, that will signal it to reduce the frequency. Um, when in fact you actually want to be increasing the frequency to get to 60 FPS. So uh, next slide. Um, so in, in this example here, this is a, a, a double buffering uh, use case. And if I use numbers in various places, I'm just assuming 60 FPS or 60 Hertz because that's the, the most common uh, frame rate. Um, but it all extends to 90 or 120 hertz. Um, um, but the important thing about uh, VBlank is for most sorts of displays, you only get one chance every, you know, 16 milliseconds to put a new frame on the screen. And if you miss that deadline, you're waiting for the next one. So uh, at the bottom here, you can see, you know, these two colors represent the two buffers and double buffering. Uh, the below shows the frame being rendered and just slightly missing the VBlank deadline, which extends the time of the previous frame on screen until the next deadline. And the uh, frequency governor sees a bunch of idle time and misinterprets that. Let me go to the next. Uh... So the idea here is uh, when you've queued up the, uh, the atomic update or page flip, um, now we know when we'd really like the GPU to be done and signal offense because VBlank is very predictable. It happens every, you know, 16 milliseconds or, or whatever. So, yep, back one. <laughs> um, so the idea is uh, to uh, set a deadline on the fence, which propagates through to the driver and the driver, you know, the GP driver, GPU driver can set a timer shortly before the deadline. If it sees it's still busy, it can boost the frequency. Um, the idea is to eventually get over that 30 to uh, 30 FPS to 60 FPS cliff. And uh, so, okay, now you can go to the next slide. And this, this is kind of a, a semi-related case. Um, in this case, there's actually a game that's limiting itself for other uh, wall, uh, reasons um, to 30 FPS. But at the bottom bar, you can see the uh, GPU utilization, which is shown as relative to the maximum frequency. So you're basically just looking at zero versus non-zero. Um, and you can see the frequencies jumping around wildly. You know, when the frequency is high enough we're rendering a frame in 16 milliseconds. But a lot of the time, because of the stalling, 
the frequency ramps down and we take, you know, two or three times as long. So the end result here is we're jumping between, you know, the frame timing is alternating between 16 milliseconds and 48 milliseconds, which is kind of jittery. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide now. And then one of the other, uh, back one more, yeah. And then one of the other goals uh, here is uh, more interactive use cases, like say you're sitting there reading a web page, and then suddenly you want to scroll down further, or you know the window switcher animation. In this case, the GPU has been idle for a while. Uh, something happens, uh, and all of a sudden it's really busy, um, and this can sometimes uh, take an interactive, you know. Uh, a utilization based governor a little while to uh, to react to. Um, and so the same same thing here. Um, the idea is, you know, when the, the next upcoming page flip is when you want to be done rendering by um, this gives an extra signal to the GPU that someone's waiting for it and it should uh, ramp up. Okay, and I'm running through this kind of fast, but uh, stop me if anyone has questions. Um, so anyways, the solution here is uh, to add a new uh, method on the DMA fence uh, set deadline. Um, I mean, this can, you know, it's not necessarily specific to vBlank, but vBlank's uh, an obvious place where you'd want to use this. Um, so in my, in my patch set, I had a call from uh, DRM Atomic Helper Wait for Fences. Um, and I, I guess I should mention uh, I-915 uh, does something similar internally where it uh, boosts the GPU frequency based on, uh, on page flip. Um, although I think that moved around last time I, I looked. Um, anyways, the deadline you set gets propagated through uh, DMA fence array, DMA fence chain, so forth, um, and eventually gets to the fence context, you know, the fence implementation. You know, if it's a fence exported by the GPU driver, it ends up there. So the fence implementation should track the nearest uh, upcoming deadline, set up a timer for, you know, hand wavy few milliseconds before that deadline. Um, and if the fence isn't signaled by that point, that's a signal to, to boost the frequency and hurry up. Um, and some other nice things about this is this works perfectly well for cases where you have a separate KMS and uh, render node, render only driver. Um, and it works with, uh, with all the DRM atomic helpers. And uh, I guess next slide. <clears throat> and a few remaining things to do. Um, Daniel Vetter had wanted to also tie this into DRM scheduler priority. Um, so we can, when you have more complex use cases, say you have uh, uh, multiple applications using the GPU at once, but only one of them is on screen. Um, maybe you want to give priority to the, the thing that the, the, the page flip is waiting for. Um, and the other, th other uh, issue is um, some compositors actually defer the decision about whether to flip to the new frame for an application until closer to vBlank. And then they'll decide to re-render either with the new frame or the old frame, depending on on whether the uh, new frame is going to be ready in time. So for this, we'll need a, um, a DMA fence FDI octal to set, set so the user space compositor can be the one setting the deadline on the fence. And uh, yeah, and then so far I haven't done too much experimentation with tuning, like how soon before the deadline should we wake up and decide to boost and so on. But uh, um, yeah, maybe maybe there's 
you know, maybe there's some room for some uh, knobs so that user space can, can tune this for, for different use cases. And uh, yeah, that's it. I, I ran through it kind of quick, but if anyone has questions, um, then fire away. Uh, sh should we like directly then jump into the timing thing too? Because it's practical at the same topic. Yeah, um, that jump into the discussion. Three Daniels, amazing. Yeah, we need more Daniels here. There's really no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely related. Um, so, like I said, on. <sighs> On Matrix, um, some of the C group stuff came out of, of Android uh, that they didn't get time to finish. So they'll they'll be taking over the the presentation time slot um, up next, just because you know I think to be fair, a lot of presentation time, at least the interesting part, is essentially falling out of. The um, but yeah, I think my my main question is, yeah, we we would definitely need to be able to inject a deadline so we can be able to um, speculatively use it rather than commit and then only have it work backwards from there. But um, have you thought much about the opposite direction when you deliberately want to to slow clients and drop GPU usage. Like if you're hitting more of a 40 frames per second cadence and you actually want to slow that so it's closer to 30. Um, I have not so much. Um, most of my problems are not going fast enough rather than <laughs> going too fast. Um, I think if you're not actually able to hit um, 30 FPS, though, and you have, like, say, and you're only using double buffering or you have something that's going to stall the pipeline, the uh, simple on demand is going to arrive there. In, you know, it's looking at how much time you're busy versus how much time you're idle. And trying to come to the, the the minimum frequency where you're never idle, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would say the same. Like essentially, the boosting is just instead of us approaching like the ideal steady state from below and maybe not getting there because of feedback loops, uh, we're approaching it from above. And I'm, I can't think of like a uh, like a case the we would be stuck at a higher frequency than ideal steady state. Or, or like, what's what's the use case you have in mind? One of the other Daniels, I mean. <laughs> I mean, like, like in a way, if the, the, yeah, like like Rob said, well, maybe even not just like the busyness, but. If we constantly hitting all the deadlines that we're getting, then we know we have headroom, and so the driver could 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 be quite a bit more aggressive. Of course, like eventually we we then stop hitting the deadline, and then we know like we we've been a bit too far, and we can go back. Yeah, so, I mean there are there are plenty of um, SysFS knobs for uh, Dev Freak, so. If user space, you know, wants to set a policy, it can limit the maximum frequency. I mean, there's actually even a user space governor where the user space can just directly control uh, the frequency. Although that's that's not what we use. No. Do you know for for Android how this works when swappy and choreographer? Um, do they? Do the implementations of those have their own similar working backwards from deadline and boost accordingly or? Um, so at least on the Snapdragon side, the Qualcomm vendor kernel has some 
magic trust zone based GPU freak governor. So magic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, you know, you, you got to use trust zone for that. <laughs> Is that trust trust zone as the patent box or yeah i think uh, that that's my interpretation uh, yeah well i thought so i mean i thought we have a bunch of android people here but i thought like on android it works by by immediately boosting when you get them the first touch at least for the internet yeah, that's that's true okay yeah this this is the part i, I didn't get around to writing the slides to um even in chrome os we have uh, input handler, both for CPU, boosting the CPU on input and on uh, on the GPU side, we don't actually use it for boosting the frequency, but just use it as an early, hey, we should wake up the GPU now because it takes about a millisecond and a half to boot up the GPU from the spend. <laughs> um, and you know, that's that's a thing you don't want to have in your critical, critical path. Um, the uh there's a slight problem in that it, it works great for touch input um because touch input is touch input um keyboard input um it on the cpu side there is a cooldown period so after it boosts it will not boost again on another input for a certain amount of time to basically you know it's it's a, the avoid the spacebar heater uh uh mechanism uh, the problem is on when you have a keyboard, certain keys you want to handle on press and other keys you want to handle on depress. You know, like modifier keys, you want to handle when they're released because you don't when they're pressed, you don't know what other key is going to go along with it. And the kernel doesn't really have that sort of um, uh, information, uh, you know, what your keyboard layout is, you know. It, it is really don't want it to. Yeah, is the caps lock key actually a search key or not? You know, um, uh, but um, so I think what we're going to try and do, um, but I think no one's had time to like actually do this yet, is move that to user space um, and have a user space thing that's uh, kind of sniffing the input events and. You know, like I said earlier, you have enough sysfs sysfs knobs to control everything from user space that would be done in the kernel. I mean, your um, your compositor is already sniffing all of the input because it has to route it, right? So, I guess, yeah. In terms of the FD to set the deadline for events, did you? what's the privilege model for that? Is it just, you can always set it or? This is, uh, yeah, it's something we kind of still need to sort out. The last iteration of my series added an iOctal because I needed something for IGT tests to use. Uh, other Daniel didn't like that yet. Um, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, one approach is you can just say, okay, yeah, let, if you have the fence FD, you are important enough to set the deadline. Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I, I guess if you have the, the fence FD, then you're sort of implicitly trusted. And right. if you're the one submitting the work, then you can just spam the GPU to death anyway. So <laughs> it's, it's, Kind of a dumb question now. I listen to myself say it out loud. So, yeah. so I was only complaining about like the lack of real user space in form of a compositor. Yeah. Okay. Fair. I think the interface itself is good. Like any app use potential is. I mean, you can already like just launch a busy loop on the CPU and burn it. Uh, same on the GPU. Like that. That's that's the C groups discussion, and and. For everything else, like as long as there's like a cooldown, so that you can't like you abuse this to get constantly higher priority than the compositor or something, I don't I don't see like an issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really get into the 
priority part yet because for our use cases, it's usually kind of simple. I mean, you have the, the GPU process, which is doing everything, <laughs> you know, compositing and all the rendering and stuff. So, you know, everything's just kind of, kind of already FIFO and, uh, and it doesn't matter so much. Um, but, but I guess with uh, Android games, like they can get ahead, can't they, of the next one? True, but I mean, yeah, usually the cases where you care it ends up being a full screen game anyways. Um, so, you know, oh, so again, there's nothing else going on with rendering, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the, I, I, not I, I, the compositor and, and like the, the game. Oh, yeah, how is this? You, you, do, you do end up with little pop ups and things like that. Um, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it, I mean, usually you're going directly to the overlay. Um, let's, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I guess when when it comes to plumbing it through to scheduler, if you want to have a prioritized compositor, then you already have to have context priorities. So maybe one thing for for the fence deadline is rather than a pure fence ioctal. Like at the moment, you you work backwards from uh from commit in kms right and you sort of plumb that back and maybe the the model for boosting from a compositor use cases to similarly push it through a drm context so empty batch with a dependency on that or something like that i mean it's, it's it's still that the, the, the actual rendering happens in the other context from the app. Yeah, but then so, so it still needs to go through the fences. I mean, honestly, I'm not worried about the priority stuff because it sounds like for Chrome OS right now, it's not a problem. Uh, we have plans to cut i915 over to DRM scheduler. And as part of that, we need to cut it over to this DRM fence set deadline stuff because this, the, the yeah, I mean, what the, the things what, we have are too clever. <laughs> yeah, what uh, one is is not, I think, too hard. I just need to think through how to implement it. But at some point, the scheduler is going to be waiting on a fence to know that it can schedule some other job, right? Um, because it's it's not you know it's deferring writing jobs into the into the ring you know with its own scheduling, which is based on waiting on a fence. So we need to propagate from that fence to the actual hardware fence, what the deadline is. Yeah, but I thought that part you have already. Um, oh, you, you mean like the, the dependency propagate? Oh. I mean, when the scheduler itself is waiting on a fence um, to schedule another job. Yeah, but for just clock boosting, it, it, it doesn't matter because as long as you boost one and you only have one GPU, which I think yeah, is your case. Yeah. It's it's all fine, and and honest. So for me, I, I, it would be perfectly fine if we offload the priority boosting and dependency boosting to uh, when I nine fifteen people need to do the conversion. Yeah, I mean, but, I so. think the the point the point I was trying to get at is the DRM scheduler fence doesn't actually propagate the deadline to the hardware fence until it has a hardware fence. So in the case that it doesn't have one yet. Oh, right. It yeah. Needs to I be guess propagated. you do miss it. Right. Yeah. So as I understand it, you're directly boosting in the, uh, in the GPU driver um, when you're hitting the deadline. Um, I, I wonder if we could uh, maybe offload some of that to the DRM scheduler. So also keep a history of missed fences or something like that on the run queue where those jobs are showing up. 
because right now uh, you you are always working backwards from missed fences and then directly boosting the GPU. But if one of those processes is idle for some period of time, you probably want to have some history of how heavy is this run queue on the GPU. And then if it's if it gets active again, because user space starts to submit jobs again, you, you really want to boost up the GPU at that time if you already know that the run queue is going to be heavy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is part of the reason. I mean, my initial idea was more reactive and giving this driver a signal that uh, that it's missed frames. But um, I think you know the better idea is to boost before you miss the first frame in the first place, and that that's the idea. I mean, that's why the implementation sets a timer a few milliseconds before V blank. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, if you have a case where the workload's varying a lot, like it's not doing something for a while and then it starts an animation or something that that's kind of hard to, to predict. Um, yeah, that, that, that's more the, 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 like the going from idle to not idle and we'll be, right. we'll be doing 9950 is, is we just kick it. And I think it keeps track, maybe it even keeps track of like a per context history of what was the last frequency, like steady state. And then, then yeah, if, if you scroll the next paragraph down on your browser or whatever, like it just kicks you back to whatever it was, half frequency of the of full. Uh, yes. by the, at the moment you submit the first thing. Yeah, so the the recent dev freak changes on the DRM MSM side actually do a combination of things. Like if you're if you've been idle for a long period relative to the sampling interval, it will give you some uh, some boost initially. Uh, for example, um, I mean it's kind of analogous to the input boost. I think the, the the thing to avoid maybe is is going full i nine fifteen and and trying to look like i nine fifteen tracks this all on every single job uh, and with priority inheritance and kicking it all out and and that's overkill in, in my opinion. yeah like a bit of boosting on like the context priority temporarily or whatever for the dependency that kind of stuff or what Lucas said tracking tracking a bit of like histogram maybe might be useful so you know okay this thing is coming in i need to crank it back up to like full speed right away and and not not yeah not um, very fancy here. yeah can you guys hear me now yeah Ah, great. Yeah, I had some problems with the microphone. Christian, yeah. Um, yeah, basically what you uh, talk about, uh, about the scheduler and uh, the back-end hardware driver is not informed about the uh, deadline until the job is actually scheduled on the hardware. It's, I think, a general problem, which I noticed in this concept before. Um, basically, when we submit something to the hardware, uh, when we submit the flip, um, the deadline will be set on the last uh, DMA buff, uh, the last DMA fence instance. The problem is now that a picture or the flip can be composed by multiple engines all over the GPU. It could be part of the 3D pipeline, it could be part of compute, and it could be part of the SDMA or the multimedia engines, like decoding or encoding or stuff like that. And um, at least for AMD hardware, what will happen is that uh, when you boost the last fence, which is most likely the one just drawing the picture on the screen, you're actually not uh, hitting the right engine. And uh, for example, for video decoding, when you say, 
okay, I should be decoding at 60 FPS or something like that, but I'm only decoding at uh, 30 or 45 or whatever. Um, the, uh, we, we would need to propagate that from the 3D engine, which currently does the color space conversion back to the uh, UVD engine or VCN engine, which does the decoding for uh, things like, uh, uh, yeah, things like transcription. I'm, I'm not sure if working with the, with, with the end of the pipeline is the right approach here. Um, so I take it the kernel is managing frequencies for all the different yeah. blocks in the GPU individually in your case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, the situation is a little simpler for us. I mean, yeah. video decode is actually even a completely separate subsystem in the kernel for us. and. We just have one top level frequency and then the GMU firmware can do more fine grain things internally in the GPU. Um, but I guess if you have multiple different frequencies, you need to wait to understand that dependency chain. Yeah, probably. I mean, the alternative would be, um, yeah, to say, okay, we are not signaling the fence, but we are uh, signaling the, the hardware which issued the fence or the, the context or something like that. But um, I don't really see how how we should do this, especially when we say um, we have uh, inter-device dependencies. Like you said, you, you could have one device which does the color space conversion and completely different drive on a different device, which does the uh, uh, which does the, does decoding or or, or 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 things like scaling or drawing and stuff like that, and at least for the scheduler, what you essentially need need I think is that you um, not propagate the deadline to the hardware fans because that's way too late but whether to the dependencies of a job so when you set a deadline and you see okay i am waiting currently on fans whatever then propagate this deadline to this fans and not to the hardware fans i think that would uh, at least be a start of solving this problem yeah, yeah i think right. that's sorry Go ahead. yeah i think that that's essentially what we'll will we need to do there for like more complex hardware that isn't just a single clock domain and i i think we, we can I, the, the priority boosting has kind of the same problem like there's no point if you're boosting the last one if all the other ones are still are still hung up and uh, yeah so uh, honestly like th this this problem use case is part of the motivation why i, I wanted to lift uh uh, the, the dependency tracking into the DRM scheduler so we could start doing these kind of things. So and, and maybe aside like... for sorry for Christian, uh, I do have like some ideas how I could yeah, get this rolled out for AMDT. I just didn't get around to it yet. Um, so I think that's... we should be should be happy here. Quick admin sorry. note: we've quick admin note. We've got like two minutes, and then we should switch over to Fridia talking us through secrets. Um, so whoever wants to get the last word in, if that's you, Jason or Christian. I was just going to comment that particularly if you're dealing with dependency change that are any longer than just 3D rendering and display displaying it, you also have a problem of figuring out sort of how to allocate time to each of the different jobs in the chain so that you can create all of those fence deadlines. And if the different drivers are allocating time independently, then they all have their own feedback loops and those feedback loops are going to start fighting with each other and you're never going to get to a competent steady state. So it, like, it, it makes perfect sense if you've got, you know, a game running full screen displaying that that case is pretty obvious how it works. But once you get the pipeline any deeper than that, I'm really confused as to how this is actually going to hit steady state without maybe something central like DRM scheduler, keeping track of things and handing out time slices. 
Maybe that. Uh, I think yeah, that's essentially the entire presentation headache, presentation timing headache, because I think discussions on that has have been ongoing for like three years by now. So, so maybe we need to resurrect Daniel Stone's topic for off the sea groups <laughs> or something like that, so we can appreciate the frustration that this topic brings in. Yeah, but I mean, that, that one's kind of been stalled in the horrible chicken and egg of we don't have higher level APIs to design against because clients don't really care about them too much because it's not plumbed down at the low end and no one knows anything of, of what's going on apart from it's really hard and it's not being solved end to end at the moment. Yeah, so I mean, th this is why I think we should just go ahead with what the Rob has now, fully aware that there's endless amounts of holes and we just need to pluck them as we go and create funny, unstable feedback loops and then figure out how to solve them. Because I think just talking about the problem has, has proven itself to be not useful. Yeah, I, I think we are in danger of trying to boil the ocean if we try to tie everything in and and get it completely complete from the start. So yeah, definitely in favor of doing it wrong and finding out. Cool. You gotta start somewhere. Sorry? I said you gotta start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Um yeah. On that note, thanks Rob slash me and other <laughs> other Daniel and uh, Christian and, and Jason and Lucas and everyone. Um, so yeah, that'll be fun. The patches are out on DRI Devel, so go have a look if you're, if you're interested. And yeah, have fun with the feedback loops. <laughs> yeah, I should hopefully have another iteration. Well, I didn't get to it this week, so hopefully next week. <laughs> All right. Nice. Okay, um, so Phrygia and uh, John and some others, anyone else who, who wants to join from the Android side, um, there were some discussions um, ongoing out of the, the Android microconf about um, C groups and, and how to allocate for, um, you know, device memory allocations and usage. So, uh, Hedger, if you want to take it away, I'd, I've made you a presenter, so you should be able to, to share anything. Uh, hi, Daniel, thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, we had a, a brief talk in the Android MC on uh, evaluating the GPU C groups for uh, uh, adoption in Android. And uh, yeah, we thought we, it would be uh, great if we could also have a discussion here so we could know uh, what you thought of uh, regarding our proposals and whether you had uh, any other ideas for us to uh, try out. Uh, so uh, Daniel, would you like me to quickly run through the slides again? Uh, just to uh, catch everyone up to where we are, where we ended uh, in the Android microconference. Yeah, I, I think that's good. I think there's a lot of people here who weren't there yesterday. So, thanks. Okay. okay, sounds good. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the presentation is about a new memory accounting feature that we are uh, looking into for. Uh, uh, looking into uh, looking for implementing into Android, and uh, over the next few slides, I can walk you through the various solutions we explored uh, to implement the same. Uh, and uh, yeah, at the end, hopefully, we can have a discussion on the next step forward. So uh, the problems that we are trying to solve uh, are that currently there is no way to limit. Uh, the total amount of DMA buff memory allocated on behalf of a process. Um, this means that uh, right now, uh, 
malicious or a faulty process can continue allocating uh, DMA buff memory until the device falls under uh, memory pressure. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, origins of a buffer leak are also hard to identify. So when we find a leak DMA buff FD held by a process, uh, due to the shareable nature of DMA buff FDs, uh, sometimes we find it hard to identify why the buffer was allocated in the first place. Uh, so these are the problems that we are trying to solve. We would like to know why a DMA buff uh, came into being, and we would also like to limit a uh, set up set an upper limit on the total amount of DMA buff memory allocated on behalf of a process. Uh, so we explored a few different uh, solutions and in the next few slides I can give you a quick quick overview of uh, our analysis. So the first solution we looked into was uh, the MEMS, uh, MEMCG controller. Uh, the problem we had with uh, the memory C group controller was that Android uses a, a per app C group hierarchy. Uh, so when we uh, evaluated enabling MemCG with the per app C group hierarchy that Android is currently using, uh, there was a noticeable overhead on some use cases, and which meant that not all partners were not all Android partners were on board with enabling the memory controller C group uh, in with the per process C, uh, C group hierarchy in Android. Uh, so yeah, we, we just didn't have all Android partners on board with enabling MemCG. So it might not be the uh, solution that we are hoping for in this case, because we would like a solution that would work for all our partners. Uh, additionally, uh, MemCG performs accounting in units of page. Uh, as you know, in the DMA buff buffer sharing model, a process takes a reference to the entire buffer, uh, hence keeping it alive, even if it is only accessing parts of it. Uh, so the per page, uh, per page memory tracking feels like an unnecessary overhead for uh, DMA buff uh, memory accounting. Uh, uh, more importantly, there is actually no need to use C groups to track which processes are holding FD or map references to a DMA buff because we already have this information available from ProcFS. So for our use case of allocator attribution for DMA buffs, uh, we feel like the memory C group controller might not be the best way forward. Um, so the next thing, uh, next solution we looked at was whether we can use a user space service to keep track of buffer allocations and releases. Uh, however, we could not find a sure shot way to intercept that, uh, to ensure that a user space service can intercept all DMA buff allocations and releases. This is because uh, allocation in uh, DMA buff allocation in Android happens through the DMA buff heap ioctils, and the buffer release, of course, happens when the last reference to the buffer has been dropped. So uh, yeah, basically there is uh, no, favor, no way for us to guarantee that the user space service would uh, intercept all allocations and releases. And this is very important for our use case of uh, setting an upper limit on how much memory can be, how much DMA buff memory can be allocated on behalf of a, of a process. Additionally, uh, this was also important to us in case the uh, user space service aggregating this data got killed or restarted uh, for some reason, we would lose all accounting so far. So we, until the device reboots, we wouldn't have the service available. Uh, we wouldn't have an effective tracking available. Uh, so, uh, you know, we uh, we looked into the GPU C group controller that is already uh, under construction upstream. Uh, and yeah, it looked like a good fit for what we wanted to do. And uh, Daniel V has also been encouraging us to uh, evaluate for Android for a few, uh, for some time now. So uh, we did that. And uh, over the next few slides, I can walk you over uh, what we found out. Uh, so 
since the GPU C group controller is actually originally intended uh, to be used by the upstream GPU drivers, the API from the latest RFC is closely tied to the uh, DRM framework. Um, if the original authors of the C group controller are uh, okay with doing so, uh, and they don't have an issue with doing so, obviously, uh, it should be easy enough to ensure uh, to modify the API to be generic, though, ensuring that it still works for DRM while also accommodating use by other DMA buff exporters like uh, DMA buff heaps. So yeah, that that is one thing we would need uh, for DMA buff heaps to use the same uh, charge and charge APIs that uh, the C group, the GPU C group controller uh, exposes. Um, so the next problem that we have is actually not really specific to the GPU C group uh, controller. Um, it is, it relates more to the way DMA buffs are allocated in Android. So in Android, uh, we have a process called the graphics allocator process or the graloc hal process which does the majority of dma buff allocations so what happens is that a client requests the uh, graloc hal process for an allocation over uh, ipc with some specific requirements and constraints and uh, the graloc hal process allocates a buffer allocates a dma buff uh, following all the uh, all the requirements that are set by the client. And once this is done, it sends the FD back to the uh, client over IPC and uh, it does not retain any references to the buffer. So what this means is that if we charge every uh, allocated buffer to the process that allocated it, uh, we are not going to have an effective uh, allocator attribution for DMA buffs in Android because the graloc hal process is going to be on the hook for all allocation, uh, or for the majority of uh, DMA buff allocations in Android. So uh, this is actually a problem for us too. Uh, to, so to solve this, uh, we proposed a few different solutions and I can walk you through all of them. Uh, really quickly. So the first, oh, we need a way, basically what we need is a way to charge a buffer uh, to the C group of a process other than that of the allocating process. So we need a way to declare that uh, this buffer should be attributed to another C group. So that's the, uh, that is the problem that we are trying to solve here. So uh, the first option we looked at was explicit charge migration uh, to, uh, that is using the C group interface to move the charge to a charge of a buffer uh, to a different C group. So in this case, that would be, uh, in the case of Android, that would be the client who requested uh, graloc hal for allocation. So uh, for example, maybe we, the allocating process could write the DMA buff FD to a file in the client process C group. Uh, so uh, however, when we took this up with uh, the C group maintainers and uh, this actually differs quite a bit from how resource uh, accounting is currently done in C group controllers. So yeah, they didn't really think that this was an upstreamable interface. Uh, the next, uh, the next solution that we looked into was maybe uh, to check whether we can come up with a mechanism similar to F advice don't need, where the allocating process can just declare that it is not going to use the allocated buffer. Uh, the buffer will then be charged to the process who uh, first uh, who accesses it next. Uh, so uh, yeah, this. So we thought that the results would be really non-deterministic non with such a scheme though, because the process who receives the FD over IPC might not map or install the FD and pass it over to another process straight away. And uh, this means that it would really not work for our use case of uh, setting an upper limit of, for allocations for, uh, of processes, processes. So uh, yeah, uh, we, we did not think that this, this solution would be a good fit 
for our use case uh, due to uh, it not being as deterministic as we want it to be. Uh, so the last option we looked into was whether we can have a new DMAB of heap allocation ioctyl uh, that takes as argument and FD uh, to the C group of the client process. So the uh, Gralak HAL process in Android that I talked about, uh, it does know who the client is, who is allocating, uh, who is requesting the allocation, and uh, it will also have information on uh, which would be the C group this process belongs to. Uh, so in the ioctyl handler, uh, the heap driver would check whether the limit for the uh, the allocation limit for the client C group has already been met. If not, it proceeds with the allocation. And if the limit has already been met, it would fail the allocation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically the limit checking and uh, charging would happen in the ioctyl handler. Uh, so to guarantee that uh, 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 SC policy would uh, SA policy restrictions would guarantee that access to this ioctyl would only be provided uh, to uh, approved processes. So for in this case, uh, uh, for the case of Android, we would probably only provide the gra uh, graphics allocator HAL uh, the permission to charge, uh, permission to use the new DMA of heap allocation ioctyl unless we find uh, other valid use cases. So um, yeah, these are the various solutions that uh, we looked into to solve this problem. So yeah, if you can think of any other approaches that we can uh, use to find a, uh, find a solution to the problem, or if you had any other, uh, anything else that, uh, any, any other suggestions that we could look into, uh, yeah, we would be really happy to collaborate. And uh, yeah, it would be nice if we could have a discussion on this. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, uh, the comment I had as well when I'd um, seen the original proposal is we kind of have the reverse problem for, for generic Linux, right? Where, you know, Android, you have the, the trusted Grelic service in one process and you need to migrate the charge across from A to B. Um, <laughs> we've got the opposite problem where the client will be doing the allocation and anything, you, you have the same problem with Hardware Composer or Surface Flinger, I guess, right? Where anything that's either implicit on um, processes owning FDs or is explicit with a client saying, charge this allocation over to this other one over here. Um, that, yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be great for us because then the client's just gonna um, account everything to the compositor. So I think one thing which would actually work for, for both, if I understand how um, policies around binder work and what you have for Android is um, if the receiving client could essentially adopt or take responsibility for um, for the allocation. So I, I think that works out because you're able to have a policy of this binder call can only come from this DSO or whatever it is, right? And for us, that would work well too, because the compositor would never say, I want to take responsibility for this allocation. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Daniel, I, I, I got a little confused. So mm -hmm. uh, are you proposing a plan to build this into the uh, binder infrastructure, uh, the binder driver itself, or is it a different scheme? Yeah, so, what I'm suggesting is that all of the suggestions 
you had involve the process or the components which made the allocation yeah transferring the allocation to something else some yeah. other pid or the other end of the socket right yeah. um what i'm suggesting is the reverse so whichever process receives the allocation is able to claim responsibility for that um, oh, okay. So that that works for the generic Linux model because it's almost always that the allocation is less trusted and the one doing receiving the FD is more trusted. Um, and I think for Android, mm -hmm. that would also be compatible with the security model because I think you have some some way to specify that um like a policy to say that uh this binder call can only be made from this shared library so you could enforce that whoever makes the call to Grelic it was coming from a dso which would also adopt the accounting uh so i'm actually uh, I don't think we can do that, Daniel, because we wouldn't, uh, we cannot guarantee which processors would uh, call out to Dalek Hal. So, uh, yeah, there is, uh, yeah, there is no, uh, we don't have a middle layer where we can uh, set a rule that only known processors can call out to the Dalek Hal. So, both. Uh, these could be vendor process too, and these it could be something on the system side too. So yeah, basically we don't have control over limiting who can call out into the Gralloc hell. Uh, okay, I I thought there was some insanely fancy mechanism where it was like this binder call can only be made from you know this code location, right? So you could delegate it to a trusted library, but. Maybe that was just a nice idea in a conference talk and it never got implemented. Yeah. So, but, so, sorry. Oh. I guess I should. Uh, but couldn't we like extend this idea and essentially like when Binder or maybe AF Unix or whatever like passes an FD along, uh, we do or maybe only Binder, we, we do an option where like it kind of closes your, your your file descriptor locally and transfers the resource allocation that is hanging off this FD with a new struct file operations callback. Maybe I'm I'm not sure with it. Like it's maybe a bit special, but uh, I mean that's kind of the entire point of having this this binder IPC thing. And and if we start attaching random C groups and other allocations to FDs, maybe we we do want to like formally transfer them, and they yeah. I think I think we we basically have um, the problem that in, inside the Linux kernel, all resource management is currently attached to the process and not to the file descriptor. So for example, um, you can also just call memfd create and just loop in, in uh, an endless loop and write bytes into it and um, after some time the out of memory killer will just kill pits but never the pit which is actually using the memory yeah. um, the, pro the, the core of the problem is that the resource uh, management system doesn't take doesn't look at file descriptors at all it just only looks at the uh, wasn't the set size or the shared set size or something like that um, of the process, but not at files the process has has open. And um, if we could adjust, or if if we could come up with a resource management for file descriptors, that would certainly be a, a start into the right direction to to solve those problems, and not only for DMA buff but also for uh, uh, for VM devices, like new devices.
uh, I think we we talked about this with Android yeah, tracking too, because uh, the Android has this OOM interface thingy, uh, but I, I think the problem was that counting at OOM time was too expensive, or, yeah, or something. I, 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 I look, and that was also another like reasons why we came up with couldn't we use C groups because Android already has like the user space OOM killer thingy. Yeah. And, and looking at, at sorry? Uh, yeah, the no memory killer demon that we talked about when we last chatted. Yeah. Uh, and so like tracking all this stuff in, in C groups and then shooting it with the user space OOM killer is, is, is seems like the, the solid approach here. It does mean that like if your tester doesn't set it up or your OS, then you're still stuck with uh, hilarity. Um, maybe since this has come up, like the entire how, how should we interact with MemCG question? Um, on, honestly, my personal take is since, since MemCG seems to be a problem for Android and we've historically not tracked any of our allocations there uh, anyway, uh, Maybe we should just like continue that and say, uh, oh, and the, like the third reason is all these special pools, even if it is in main memory, like there's, there's the, the TTM page pool, the, there's the various ion uh, DMA buff heaps and all these, like I, I'm leaning to with tracking DMA buffs in, in like a, a device or sp special C groups controller, even if it's like in system memory. And kind of taking it out of MemCG, but that, that's maybe also like a question we have. I'm I'm not sure if I'm really understanding what the premise here is. Are we talking about like a um, C group controller for controlling all of DMA buffs, regardless of which device they're actually coming from, or are we looking at something more fine grained where where that usage is tracked uh, per device? Uh, I think both. So, so maybe, maybe there's one overall for all the DMA buffs and then per memory pool, whatever that thing is, could be like uh, VRAM or uh, like if you have multi GPU, something right. interconnected, a, a piece of VRAM, maybe if you have like more Anuma GPU or oh, on the, on the Android sock side, it's like the, the various uh, CMA heaps in, in system memory. So yes. that, that would kind of be split out. In, in my and, mind, and obviously it's just... is not an allocator. It's a buffer sharing mechanism, right? And, and tracking usage on the buffer sharing mechanism seems kind of weird. I would track it at the level of the allocator where the memory actually comes from. I, I, maybe this is the confusion between Android and Linux, because on Android, DMA buff is the allocator. Yeah, and Android kind of abuses DMA buff a bit. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah, basically, it's uh, Android, the, yeah, it's, it's different. That's a bit questionable, but okay. They, they can do what they want. I mean, basically on Android, each allocated buffer is keep the DMA buff file descriptor handle for. On normally Linux or uh, and DM drivers or video for Linux drivers, um, we use only use the DMA buff file descriptor handle as intermediate handle. So what the driver does is um, exports its buffer, user space gets the file descriptor, imports it on the other side, and the file descriptor is then closed. Android, on the other hand, keeps those file descriptor around for a very, very long time, as, as long as the buffer exists. Um, yeah, Felix is generally right that this is maybe not the best design um, because a you run into file descriptor limitations so the, the number of file descriptors you can have open is, li is quite limited i think around 1024 by default uh, or something. it's lifted it's lifted, lifted. yeah okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this was lifted. probably outdated my, my information on that anyway um yeah in, in general, when we want, would want to solve the um, MemCG interaction between drivers and MemCG, 
we wouldn't do that on the on the DMA buff level in general, I think. Yeah. So I think it's just naming here. Like for Android, this is the DMA valve CG, uh, C, uh, CG, uh, C group controller thingy, right? But like in Linux, it wouldn't like it wouldn't kick in only when you do the DMA buff export. It would kick in when you allocate from an allocate. It's just on Android, like the allocate port and the export to DMA buff is one thing. Yeah, and, and that's why all, all the Android people talk about the uh, the DMA buff. C group controller, but that's but it's really it's really like, like an allocated right? C group controller. Sorry, that's only really true for for the display buffers that are shared with the compositor. Like internal allocations in the user mode drivers, I don't think they would use DMA buff. Uh, they they are all going through uh, the Crelog allocator, so they have a central allocator for all the DMAable memory. So it's all going to one device that's. Have it, uh, controlling the DMA buff heaps and then uh, allocating from there. So all, okay. all the graphics memory is coming from Greylock. So even the in driver internal allocations. So, okay. so uh, yeah, it, it's really a different world to the general Linux system where you have uh, the allocations uh, scattered around different drivers and then just have DMA buff to glue it all together and uh, transfer handles to those allocations uh, between different drivers. And Android, where you have one central instance where all the allocations are happening, and then Greylock is handing out allocations with DMA buff handles to all the user space components. Okay. Well, there is an interesting parallel there to Rockham, where we have this um, shared virtual address space across multiple devices. And if we want to share those buffers uh, over peer-to-peer uh, -peer DMA, we'll basically have to export all our, our buffers as DMA buffs so that we can import them on the other device. And so we have some code in the works for that, um, where basically all of the VRAM gets exported as DMA buff, so it can be imported on other GPUs. And so we'll heavily depend on the DMA buff move notifier so that we don't lose the ability to evict our VRAM buffers. And so that, that means basically all memory allocations will be DMA buffers. And uh, so if you overly limit uh, the DMA buff usage, you'll be in trouble. But it sounds like Android is going to be in the same boat. So you basically have to set the limits appropriately to, to satisfy all the applications memory allocations. Yeah, I mean, the limit is not like limit on shared buffer. It's limit on like GPU memory allocations. Okay. That, that's right. the goal. So, uh, and I don't think in practice it's it's going to be a problem because like, sure, it's called DMA buff C group, but like even on Android, it's not in the DMA buff .c file. It's in the DMA buff heaps, which is like the allocator. Yeah. And and on in the DRM subsystem on like the more Linuxy drivers, we, we we can just smash it into all the allocators, uh, because the the DMA buff export step does not actually do any any accounting. So. But yeah, maybe maybe the patch series or the doc patch should have this in in like the the intro section about hey, there's the slight naming confusion between Android and Linux about what things do and how they work. Yeah, I think what we're really talking about here is device memory allocations, not really DMA buff, but uh, memory that's allocated by a device driver or uh, the ion heaps on behalf of a user space process. So. Right, and then you're using DMA buff to attribute which process it gets accounted to, right? No, I don't think the DMA buff framework would need any changes at all uh, for the charging and charging mechanisms. For example, like Daniel mentioned, in the case of DMA buff heaps, each of the heap driver would be the one invoking the charge uh, uh, and uncharge API because the release uh, export operation is also set by the uh, DMA buff exporter, which in in this case is the heap driver, right? So there would be no code in the DMA buff framework, uh, which relates to charging and uncharging. It would all be uh, done in the exporter side. So for example, the drivers and the DMA buff heaps. Well, I guess if we go with the binder for the, the charge transfer thing, 
maybe binder or DMA, or like maybe there, there might be something there. So that binder now is, oh, this is like, like if we do the charge transfer only for DMA buff and not as a, as a struct file operations kind of fully generic interface, then, then maybe we need to have something there that, hey, please transfer the charge. Thank you. But, but yeah, otherwise, like this, this has nothing to do with DMA. Oh, by the way, Lucas, the, the ion heaps are called DMA buff heaps now, just to, to make the confusion perfect. Right. <laughs> okay, is anyone? Yeah, so the one thing I'm wondering about is if if we are tracking all this memory in uh, a totally different world. Um, it's how this would interact with the general memory accounting in the Linux kernel. So currently, we don't really account graphics buffers at all, even if they're in SysRAM. And we have all the obvious problems with that, with uh, the wrong processes getting killed if uh, a GPU process is going haywire and allocating memory. Uh, without touching it from a user space, just with the GPU. Um, and I would really like to, yeah, have at least some kind of, yeah, road towards uh, solving that problem also, because that's something we, we really have, <laughs> yeah, hanging around since a few years and it's not getting, and we are not making any progress on that. So, so, I, I'm not really sure if just accounting the DMA buff stuff is the right thing to do and accounting it in a totally different C group. So, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a, essentially the MCG question. Because if we just slap, we'll just, just slap GFP or memalloc over like all our system, uh, system memory allocations. So even when they go through through like CMA or, or anyway, like by the time they, they hit, hit the page allocator, it, if we consistently set the GFP mem alloc or whatever, uh, maybe it's called different, flag, then all that stuff will be uh, accounted to the, the, memor uh, the kernel memory, system memory uh, usage in, in the memcg controller. And Tejun has brought this up from the, from the C groups maintainer side. The problem is, like, apparently the, the the overhead of enabling this is quite a thing, and it might also be a bit a game of whack a mole because getting the GFP flag so uh, like passed down through all the layers, including DMA API and everything, might be a bit entertaining. So my somewhat pragmatic stance here is that we just truck and keep doing what we've been doing, but it's definitely an open question, yeah. The, the other thing is also what it, this wouldn't help anywhere where you have special memory pools like CMA. Because MEMCG understands user space allocations versus kernel space allocations, but it does not understand, oh, you've run out of like stuff here or there. So even, even if we fully wire up MEMCG across all GPU drivers, uh, DMA buff heaps and whatever else there is, but we still have a we still have a pretty massive gap in in the accounting. Right. So yeah. <laughs> so so again, yeah, we shouldn't yeah. try to boil the ocean, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so so I mean, like, if if you have a sock with a, with a display that needs cont contact memory, right? 
um, you want to make sure that your compositor can always allocate whatever is there, then you still need a user space OOM killer for your config memory and, and probably still a C group controller specifically for all the CMA allocations. So, yeah. And, and I'm also get, like, for the OOM killer, I'm also getting the, the feeling that the path forward that user space is picking is, is a user space OOM killer. Like Android has it since forever. I, I don't know about Chrome OS, maybe someone knows. But yeah, System D is rolling out their own OOM killer because like the kernel just doesn't know enough. And so like, Android will glue DM above C groups into the OOM killer. Like it shouldn't be too hard to do this into system D OOM. And that, that would solve the problem too, I think. Yeah, then the next complication is devices with uh, local memory. So <laughs> uh, what's the limit if you, if you have a device that's having four gigs of memory and four gigs of VRAM? And uh, do you try to charge the C group when evicting stuff from VRAM or, and decharging it uh, if you're moving back to VRAM? Or how would that work? <laughs> Oh, so we discussed this a bit, and I think it was Alex Deuker who brought up that there's machines out there with substantially more VRAM in total than system memory. Yep. Um, like at first, I was like, we, we need to make sure that eviction keeps working. Uh, but like, if you have more VRAM than system memory, then eviction is not guaranteed to work. And now I'm leaning to it. If you've misconfigured like your limits and it doesn't work, you just get to keep the pieces. Like if, if you have, for example, like, I don't know, a, a, a server thing and you set like, uh, the, the, the disk, uh, well, not disk, NVMe nowadays, block IO limits to, to, to guarantee that your server gets all the memory needs. But then you forget to like give it enough CPU time and they can't actually use it, then it's like, yeah, you just screwed up. So if if you said like your your VRAM limits stupid and, and your system RAM limits stupid so that eviction doesn't work and your workload fails and everything crashes, it's like yeah, it's like don't do that. I, so I don't think yeah. Shooting in your foot foot is supposed to hurt. Yeah. So I yeah. I mean, I, I guess mirroring what normal anonymous memory does when you swap it out, like there's probably some kind of sense in that. Um, and how how far do you go down that rabbit hole in the sense of when you evict to swap, does that also get charged against your block IO quota? Like, you know, there's it, how deep do you want to go with that, right? Um, yeah, I mean, but we, we, speaking we, of. Yeah. Exceeding. We have been discussing that also. Um, one requirement which comes up quite often is to have a C group controller which controls local device memory, like VRAM on, on graphics hardware. And um, the problem with that is uh, people think they can then say, okay, this application should only use maybe one gigabyte of, of uh, video memory. What they don't think about is that the application then won't stop magically using exactly one mega, one gigabyte of video memory, but they will still allocate more whatever they need, and you end up with uh, eviction and um, uh, and moving buffers in and out of VRAM. Um, so what you actually want to uh, control is not the amount of video, VRAM an application uses, but the amount of I.O. an application causes, like how much uh, uh, shuffling of buffers, how much block I.O., like you said, to when, when they actually, when we actually do swapping because an application is running wild and allocating everything it can get, ETC. 
And um, so um, device memory is, is basically just like a cage of system memory, I think. Um, speaking of exceeding allocations where <laughs> we're running up right, um, right against our time limit. Um, is there something anyone wanted to say in conclusion? Or? So I can follow up on the binder approach that uh, Daniel, uh, you and uh, Daniel, we had talked about. Uh, and yeah, uh, I mean, I can reach out to you guys on what should be the next step once I do that. Uh, and include uh, Kenny and uh, Brian as well, since uh, they own the GPC groups. But by the way, for the, the charging, did, did you chat with Tejun about this problem? I, uh, I've never... Yeah, we had a thread with Tejun uh, about the charging issue, Daniel. So, so uh, yeah, he, the first approach that I mentioned, the one using the C group interface for explicit charge migration. So he was not okay with that. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the last approach that we talked about, the using a separate IOPTIL that is completely different from the C group interface. Uh, yeah, they seemed mild, mildly okay with that, uh, but I will follow up on whether that is going to be okay. With the okay. yeah. Yeah, maybe check with them whether the the binder based yeah. charge transfer is is looking reasonable. Yeah, definitely. So I'll I'll definitely look into that next. I think that should be the next step for me. Thank you. Yeah, and to stop the bike shedding early, uh, I really do believe that this is not. Uh, uh, the GPU C group is not the right place to uh, have this memory allocation uh, tracked by because uh, in a general Linux user space, we, we really want to hook in other allocators like the video for Linux allocator and stuff like that. So I, I do not think that a GPU memory limit is the right thing uh, to uh, uh, to name this, but it's more uh, device memory uh, C group or something like that. I mean, that, that's why it was called DMA buff C group, but that's also confusing. Yeah. But yeah, there's a bike shot. Oh. <laughs> we'll get that. Okay. Um... Thanks a lot, Fredja and Daniel and Christian and, and Lucas again and, and everyone else. Um, it's like we've got some good sheds to paint. Um, okay, so we now have a, some of you might welcome this, I know I am. 15 minute break or uh, thereabouts. So after we come back in 12-ish minutes from now, um, Daniel Phillips and some of the, the other AMD compute people are, are going to walk us through HMM and what that means and um, stick themselves up for all of the tomatoes we can throw at them, I think. Yeah, hope to see you there. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Okay. Um, yeah, so hope you all enjoyed the break and, and catching your breath. Um, you know, I've got some iced tea and a Australia's finest baked goods, the, the lamington ready. Um, so yeah, uh, Daniel and Felix and a cast of thousands from uh, AMD are going to run us through um, <laughs> HMM, HSA, KFD, SVM, various other acronyms I missed in um, essentially the more compute and less display uh, focused side of the world. Um, and especially how that, that interacts with the, the memory manager. Um, so 
Daniel, were you sharing to kick off? Yeah, was um, that was the plan. And uh, how do I address, uh, address you? Do I say uh, good day? <laughs> Anyway, you like. Um, I mean, I, I'm about half half by this point, so you can say hello if you like. Um, hello. <laughs> yeah. So you should have um, down in the bottom in the, the tray with your your mute button as well. Um, you should have a screen share. Um, yeah, I've got a screen share, uh, but we've also got Felix's slides. Um, okay. Uh, somewhere, yeah. So, can we get those up somehow? Uh, Felix, you can now share if you like. Okay, uh, and then I think I'm just going to share my screen. That's the easiest way, I think. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so I'll get started. Uh, so here I am on my my Ryzen 1700 eight core uh, desktop um machine running debian sid and uh and here we are uh meeting together on the best and most modern uh video meeting software in the known uh universe and uh, i just have to say uh oh, geez in the 23 years since i started working on the linux kernel we've come quite some way <laughs> uh yeah back then it was uh windows 98 ruling world um so today we're entering kind of a new world and part of that is uh the ascendancy of the gpu um where we have uh more processing power now on the gpus by by a large by orders of magnitude uh, that we have on our even our multi-core CPUs, and um, and more memory too, and um, that's really something new for the Linux uh, kernel, or relatively new. Not maybe not new for Felix, but uh, new for a lot of us. Um, so that's what we're here uh, today about. Uh, we are ex uh, we are expanding. Um, the scope of of what uh linux uh kernel can do with uh gpu memory and uh and in the process um kind of breaking new ground and defining a model for device uh memory in general although to be honest our purpose uh today here is more specific than that um uh, we want to get a patch set merged and we want that specifically for migrating uh, device memory. So uh, that's what we're going to try and focus on. But just let me uh, diverge a bit here. Um, and, uh, and and wax poetic about uh, about where I think the GPU is is going. Uh, well, for one thing, it's uh, what we're doing here is soon going to be part of the world's biggest uh, supercomputer, uh, that is the uh, Frontier uh, supercomputer and, uh, and others. Um, so that's the immediate importance, uh, but it's not going to stop there. Um, this kind of uh, device memory sharing between the processor and GPU is going to become part of many different kinds of devices even even cell phones i can see it uh i can see the ascension of the gpu and the cell phone as well that is uh computing on the gpu and and sharing of memory is uh, uh soon we're all going to have vision processing and ai processing and we already do to some extent but we're going to have a lot more of it and we're going to have things that we don't even know about yet uh, and we're going to have this kind of thing on our desktops as well. Of course, we already do, but we're going to have more of that uh, again. Um, so yeah, we're uh, kind of biting, uh, nibbling at the corner of something that's going to become much bigger over time. And uh, and with that said, I'm going to uh, kind of bring the uh, 
talk back to the uh, real, uh, the present universe uh, and get uh, uh, ready to hand over to, uh, uh, to Felix. Uh, so what we would like to do, the, the format for today's uh, uh, microconference, uh, which was going to be a boff, um, uh, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes, and I've just about used that up. And then Felix is going to present uh, the content on the slides, which is designed just to be a few minutes. It was designed to fit a uh, a boff rather than a mini conference. Um, uh, but I'm sure Felix can go on uh, for as long as we have uh, with uh, interesting technical content and war stories. Uh, but what we really want to do is we want to meet uh, the people in the room. Uh, we want to meet anybody who's interested in this. We are particularly interested in uh, meeting and, and, and engaging with uh, people who are in the, uh, in the LKML threads uh, having to do uh, with merging our uh, memory uh, migration for uh, device memory uh, as part of HMM, um, which we would like to get merged by uh, uh, in the 516 kernel if we possibly can. So uh, that's our goal. Um, okay, so I am just about done with uh, framing that. One more thing. Um, uh, anybody here should err on the side of turning on their uh, video. I think we've got the uh, the the bandwidth uh, for that seems to be okay. And err on the side of uh, turning on your uh, your sound. And uh, and please do introduce yourself the first time uh, we speak. Uh, 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 you speak. Uh, so uh, with that, um, uh, we're really to go. Uh, uh, so here's uh, Felix. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, so yeah, my name is Felix. Um, I'm uh, technically lead architect at AMD and the kernel mode driver team for uh, the GPU compute driver. Um, so I just kind of threw these slides together yesterday. Um, like Daniel said, this was supposed to be a buff. Uh, so the slides are more or less um, kind of an introduction to, to what we want to talk about and kind of keep the discussion focused uh, on, on what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so yeah, let's let's get started with that. So um, Daniel started talking about like the memory management, how we're changing the way we do memory management on the GPU. And then so the um, tool we're using here is H it's HMM, the Heterogeneous Memory Manager. Uh, this is something that has been introduced a few years ago, originally by Jerome Glees, um, and has since been worked on by several people, uh, including um, Christoph Helwig, who has made lots of contributions to it, um, um, Jason Gunthorp, who is the official HMM maintainer right now from Mellanox, and more people than I can really name here. Um, so HMM was originally um, motivated by basically getting a better integration between the Linux uh, page allocator and virtual memory manager and how uh, devices manage their memory. Um, GPU drivers had been uh, doing a kind of like a, um, uh, well, more or less broken way of, of trying to do the same thing with uh, get user pages and MMU notifiers, basically trying to get system memory mapped into their uh, GPU address spaces. Um, different drivers have implemented this in slightly different ways, and, and each of those implementations has been buggy in different ways. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are lots of uh, potential pitfalls with race conditions and lock dependency issues. I know Kristen and I have worked through a lot of those uh, in the AMD GPU driver side for uh, over the course of probably years. Um, so, HMM has kind of provided a toolbox to kind of unify a lot of that very complicated, uh, very complex code and interaction with the memory manager, and then and, and, um, provided the tools for driver to to kind of achieve that uh, in, in a clean way uh, and with hopefully as little um, bugs and race conditions and, and uh, intermittent issues as possible. 
Um, it also has added new functionality that was not really previously possible. Um, uh, so we have the zone device where we can represent device memory pages in VMAs. So they, they are part of the regular anonymous or fileback memory maps in, in a process um, and kind of integrates uh, device memory with a shared virtual address space um, in that way. Um, and at the same time provides the ability to migrate memory into uh, device memory to provide the best possible performance uh, without losing that shared virtual memory kind of capability. Uh, there is documentation for this in the uh, kernel documentation, which currently is mostly written for driver developers. Um, and that's one of the challenges I think we want to address in this, in this um, session here. Um, so let me move on. So the, what motivated the, originally the, the BOF and then now this session here in the GPU uh, memory management uh, microconference was a patch series that we submitted for um, uh, basically adding uh, device public memory to HMM or basically some ability to have coherently CPU visible device memory integrated into HMM and uh, have the ability to have that mapped in the CPU side and migrated to the device at the same time. Um, there were a number of questions raised in that uh, code review that are seemingly quite fundamental to how HMM works. And, and so I think there, there might be a need for more documentation of HMM, not geared towards the driver developers, but geared towards other subsystems in the kernel that now willingly or unwillingly interact with uh, device memory through HMM. Um, so some of the questions that were raised here is, um, should the zone device pages be uh, classified as PFN valid? Um, so, how does sorry, sorry Felix, like, don't these already have pretty well understood answers? Maybe they do, Ahmed, but uh, nevertheless, those questions were raised on the code review by, by people who I thought should know this stuff and tell, tell me how this works rather than me telling them. So I think this is worth discussing here and maybe documenting. So my understanding of PFN, oh, PFN valid, I don't know. There was a big thread about PFN valid recently, and I think it came down to, it means there's a struct page. Right, that was my understanding too. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, what I suspect is that Christoph had some idea about how to repurpose PFN valid to, uh, uh, to, to do some new work and simplify the API, and he never did uh, elaborate on that. Uh, does page lock guarantee exclusive access to zone device pages? I think the answer is just no, because they can be, they can be in forks and things, right? Shared memory. How does uh, it yeah, what, so what do you mean by exclusive access? Are, are, are you talking about the contents of memory? Are, are you talking about the metadata that's in the struct page? I was probably thinking of the metadata and um, I think most of the page locking is really done by the migration helpers. So I, I don't think there's too much interaction with the drivers. I think we provide locked pages as one point and then, then the migration helpers take over from there. Um, so as I understand it, I don't think it's a problem. I think the the, um, the semantics of how the page metadata is managed is, is not that different for zone device than it is for other pages. But I mean, hey, that's up for discussion. So let's see if, if someone else knows more than me. Well, I, I, I think the, the problem is that the zone device work was just shoveled in without any real understanding of what it does by anyone in the MM side of things. And it didn't help that it was all kind of done weirdly with like the page ref council messed up, like you're trying to fix with Ralph. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, we keep running into it. Like there's this other thread with, with Zhao about the dev map stuff and get user pages. Like what the heck is that for? Apparently it's not needed. It's covering up a security bug or something. Okay, so that's what we're here uh, for. And um... hang, on, hang on, Daniel. Um, the so I, I, I think the fundamental problem is that HMM tied its wagon to DAX, 
And that was the fundamental mistake, because as, as far as I can tell, the two things really have very, very little in common. And so whenever you're trying to do something that works for HMM, you end up having to think about, well, what does DAX need? And, and, and vice versa. And so I think the thing we can do that will be most helpful is splitting apart DAX and HMM. Are, are you confident that they don't need exactly the same thing? I, well, when I talked to Jerome last about this, <laughs> he failed to convince me that DAX and HMM needed the same things. Now, clearly he then talked to Dan Williams and managed to convince Dan that, that DAX and HMM needed exactly the same things, but they sounded entirely different to me. My understanding of DAX is quite limited, so I, I couldn't convince you either. Uh, <laughs> but just, just looking at the code, like I don't see a strong significant divergence, like zone device is all about giving a, a struct page that's not CPU memory. Um, and that's kind of where DAX falls, that's, that's where HMM falls, that's where that weird P2P thing falls. Actually, no, uh, uh, DAX, uh, the, um... P persistent memory is CPU memory. It, it's it's on the, the the DRAM bus. It it is directly addressed by the CPU at all times. Um, then, then why is it so special? Why is it special in every way? Why does it have special ref counting? Why does it have special is is DAX tests everywhere? So I, I think the only thing that's really special about uh, DAX memory is that when you try to gup it. You don't want to um, bump the ref count on it. You want to bump the ref count on the thing that owns it. Mm, no, the, when you gup the DAX memory, you you get blocked from doing long-term gups. I think that's the only special thing there. Uh, but the the gup the behavior of all these subtypes of zone device is all different. Like if you gup a device public or device private page, I would expect it to migrate it to CPU memory. Device private, sorry, device public should not get migrated because that's CPU accessible to where it is. That's no, wait, didn't we delete the device public or something? It was deleted. We're trying okay. to add it back. Um, I mean, okay. the cut series that's under review right now, originally we were trying to kind of repurpose device generic for what we want to do. And we're convinced to instead add back the device public because it's sufficiently different from device generic. <laughs> There's our expert. My, my ears are burning on, on my mobile, so I just ran back up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us if if DAX is the same as as GPU memory? <laughs> no, not even the same, not, even, not even the same universe. Like the uh, like uh, Jerome latched on latched on to Zone Device because oh I got I got pages and that was that was that was where the similarities ended immediately there because DAX is about memory that has no business being touched by the page allocator has no coordination with um, with with the core MM. It's independent. It's just it's just there for get user pages, and uh, HMM use cases. We don't want get, get user, we, we don't want get user pages. We want to we want to work with the page allocator. We want to be tightly integrated with process and memory management. Um, so the only thing they have in common is struct page, which is like the entire kernel. Um, and it, so it was it was just a way to add struct page at random places, and that's that's where the that's where the entanglement ended. In my view. Do we benefit by having a zone DAX and a zone not DAX? I don't think, I mean, um, like we have the zone subtype already. Yeah, we really have enough it, zone types is, is the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think we, I don't think we help ourselves by adding more zones, like, um, and the zone device, um, yeah, stuck in, um, and then wasn't, then wasn't kicked out. But yeah, I mean, because it, it, it takes up bits in the, um, in the page metadata for like where does page where did this page go and we're we're already kind of trying to over there's pressure on that space because that's where we put our node numbers too and so numa node numbers are getting more precious because people want to use numa node numbers to describe memory types so if we start if we uh, if we increase our zone types we squish our we squish our numa node numbers I'm not sure we want to um, want to go there either so I mean maybe zone device is actually a way to to plug in all that weird infrastructure under another multiplexer. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, th I think I think I think zone device should yeah is 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 um is the starting point for to branch out to other things. Like I like I don't I I, th I think I think it's super useful to be able to describe describe things with struct page only because of the legacy. Like I think I think if we can get rid of struct page, great. But we haven't been able to get rid of it. Um, so as long as struct page is there, I think we need something like zone device to say, hey, there's some other way to tell the kernel about pages that not that's not the uh, that's not the system memory map that there's pages that devices there's pages that devices discover and tell the kernel about. I think that's a useful a useful mechanism. Um, but then yeah, but then how to how to do the differentiation? Like it's leaked into all kinds of problems with like uh, like the memory failure path says if this zone device page happens to be a DAX page, we know how to do the memory failure for HMM. We have no idea how to do it, so we punt. Um, and well, that seems like an abstraction breakdown. Like if, if zone device is supposed to be a place to plug in all this stuff, DAX should not have gone in and just put DAX, if DAX in the memory failure, it should have plumbed it through zone device so that the other providers can provide memory failure semantics. Plum, I mean, plumb it through zone device I means all, all zone devices is PFM. Well, I mean, have, have an actual abstraction that it could be plumbed through, like a, an, an ops table for the different subtypes or something. Um, maybe I mean yeah, like the so we're, we're actually going the other way now is 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 um, uh, file systems want to be involved in memory management, and so it's not it's not it's not like we could push things down into zone device. We have to like we have to, we have to push things up into the people that are that are who might be owning that PFN at this point in time, because but it's, it's, it's definitely DAX problem because DAX, DAX punched through PFNs to sectors to storage so. A lot of things got um, a lot of abstractions got taken away because we don't have an indirection for uh, for that kind of stuff. But I mean, I, but, yeah, I, I mean, I take your point. I, I I think I think the I think the re only reason punted on punted on memory failure for HMM was just total lack of any knowledge about how memory failure handling would work for a GPU side of it. Um, so I was, kind of, I was kind of hoping for hoping for the HMM people to. It has to be plumbed down to the the the, the 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 driver that's providing the physical memory it has to implement all of this weird stuff, right? That's why, like I say, like is DAX is not helpful. You need to plumb it down to the driver that's actually that's created the zone device in the first place, and that's what kind of I would have envisioned as a zone device API being in the MM. Is it a way for the driver to plug into the into the kernel's MM and customize all these special things that that we have? Uh, and so to answer, like. I mean, to answer Matt's sort of challenge is, is it the same as DAX? And that's where I, you know, very hand wavy come to is, it, yeah, it's a way to plug into different places and we should try and make them more the same by making an abstraction layer here rather than having is DAX everywhere and then throwing our hands up and saying, I don't know what HMM is all about. HMM is, you call the sure. GPU driver and the GPU driver, each one is going to be different and they have to figure out what to do in these special cases. but. Right now, I think they don't even know what the cases are that they need to do. Yeah, I th I th yeah, I, th I, th I think I think the the is I think the is DAX sprinkling is not what we want. We want we want more ops handlers and and saying, uh, I am the owner. I am the owner of this PFN. I need to get called back when something when something happens, which is which is what we're doing now for memory failure handling. Is the memory failure now instead of trying to have a common memory failure with a bunch of is DAX in it, it actually just hasn't. Has an operation instructor that says, "Hey, is somebody, is, is, is whoever owns this PFN, do you do you know how to handle memory failure?" And that, and we call that callback, and then that, and that callback says, "Hey, do you actually file system?" Uh, so, so right, right now we're building up a chain of memory failure talks to the PMEM driver, talks to talks to the file system to, to pass these operations of anybody who. So it's it's like like a notifier, but it's just more more explicit. But yeah, I think I think I agree with you that um, that we need more of we need more of that. Like pretty much pretty much everywhere there's an ISDAX is probably a, a place where where a upper upper level software has a better idea of what to do with it. When you're talking so, about memory failures, you're talking about things like MCE events. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, uh, if you're talking about device memory coming from a GPU, for example, I don't think you would get MC events for those. I mean, if there is, if the GPU supports ECC, the, the, that event would be detected by the GPU driver first and then maybe handed up the other way. When we're talking about high availability enterprise systems, you could get an MC because your PCI link died okay. in the middle of a CPU read, right? <clears throat> okay, so it's not a problem with the memory itself, but with the bus in that case, all right. 
it's the well, whole architecture. And, 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 you know, any point where the you could get it for an AER too, like any point where the CPU is stalled on a read or something, and the the underlying everything can't provide data there. You should really trigger an MCE, and you should really recover the CPU and try and keep going. That's what Enterprise RAS is all about. And you know, ECC on the GPU doesn't excuse you. You could still have a double bit failure on your GPU or or a chip failure, whatever the granularity is, and and you still have to bubble that all the way up and recover the CPU that's now blocked on that read. And and the memory failure core routine gets called in both that synchronous case of like I'm ha I'm handling a machine check right now and and the asynchronous case of my platform firmware, my BMC or some other agent said, by the way, this PFN that you might access in the future is bad now. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. So so I, I would expect that for HMM that if the if the GPU experienced uh, some problem it, like the page went bad on the GPU side, that it would somehow tell memory failure. So memory failure can can offline the page or migrate it or or, or do whatever do whatever it needs to do. Um, to make sure that page doesn't get accessed again if it, if it can't be repaired. Yeah, I mean, the reality is probably GPU world isn't there yet. Like they don't care about that kind of RAS level. Um, no, we GPU do clusters. <laughs> we well. have RAS on, on our uh, data centers GPUs and um, I wasn't uh, thinking of the um, interactions with the CPU side. I, I was thinking more of the GPU side where the GPU detects the ECC error and handles it inside the GPU driver and the CPU might never find out. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're right. If, if, the, those, if that memory gets accessed by the CPU and the CPU access is failing, then uh, I guess that that's relevant on, on that side as well. So we've been talking a lot about uh, having uh, 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 um, operations vectors for, for various things, and, and we already have one of those for pages, right? It's page mapping AOPS. So is, is there anything we'll be talking about that can't be handled through that? I mean, you know, maybe, maybe there isn't an AOP, a, a specific AOP for the thing we want to do, but in, in concept, could we add some of those things there? At, at least for, um, it's, uh, 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 at least for mappings, the problem is that the mapping is a one-to-one -one relationship, and file systems want to make that a one-to-n for for replink. So, map, mapping is is hard, or is con ma mapping is contended. But all the mappings would have the same AOPS, right? Because the, the you 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 you. The only time when the file system would have set different AOPS is like if the page is part of a directory on one hand and part of a file on a different hand, and that's not going to happen for the same page, right? It's, it's going to be two files. So it's going to be, always going to be the same AOPS, even if there might be two mappings that want to talk to it. Do, do we have AOPS? Isn't that a kind of a high level? Are, are you talking about the PG map AOPS or, or sorry, OPS or? I'm talking about ad address space operations oh. that you find in include linuxfs.h. I don't think that matches what they're trying to do here. They want to they want to take like a, a chunk of anonymous memory and just drop in a zone device page through migration, and it's still an anonymous VMA. So the FOPs are still, and the address space is still wherever it came from. Um, well, that's interesting. I didn't realize that for the HMM use case, you were actually talking about anonymous memory. Yeah, that's I mean, we'll be interested in doing fileback memory in the future as well, but currently I think it only really supports anonymous memory for migration. Yeah, that's that's where they really are completely different um, between DAX and what this stuff is all about. Is that this stuff is about taking anonymous memory and turning it into device memory and then allowing it to kind of flop back and forth depending on demand. And DAX is all about starting with device memory and just keeping it as device memory. <laughs> the more I learn, the more I think, no, no, I was right the first time. The, these two things are entirely different. <laughs> yes. Well, the similarity is they're plugging in device memory into the system. Right? We probably do want to get file. Uh, uh, back memory um, worked into this, but not necessarily in the immediate uh, patch set. That would be kind of a steep uphill climb. Uh, but yeah, we should have that discussion and figure out um, 
you know, how you're going to be able to um, mem map this GPU memory. That's a real thing. And, the, and there's already some existing examples of that. They just don't work, you know, all that well. They, they, they work, but there are performance issues and so on. I think there's still a fundamental difference between DAX and HMM in the sense that with DAX, the device memory is the actual storage location where it's with HMM, the device memory would be the page cache, right? Uh, the device memory is the device memory, right? It's, it's still well, no, but I mean, you're using device, device memory if to, to basically as the page cache location of, of your... I, you've gone into right? FS land and I don't think, I don't know if any of us are prepared to talk about FS land until we get... Okay, and I admit I don't know much about it myself, but I'm, I'm kind of trying to see the fundamental difference, right? I mean, with DAX, you're trying to get direct access to the storage device on the CPU, whereas with HMM, if we are starting to do HMM with fileback memory, I think we the, want the page cache to migrate to device memory. The difference is the locus of control. In DAX, the file system is in control. It knows everything that's going on. It's built on okay. top of DAX. In what you're talking about, the file system's locus of control has been co-opted and you've gone in and taken stuff that logically owned by the file system in the page cast and just changed it to something else. And that's mm -hmm. where you're going to get into all the resistance. That's exactly what Dave Chinner was complaining about. Um, you need some kind of protocol where you can go to the file system and say, hey, I want you to, I want you to rebalance your page cache in this special way. And the file system needs to kind of be cognizant of this happening to it. Especially since it has very specific things like like the the dirty bit no longer works and you can no longer write protect a page once you've done this. It's like a like a huge mess. Yeah, I mean th that's kind of a question I had. Um, I mean, how does this even work? Like ignoring all of the migration stuff. Today with HMM we can map um, a fileback page into the device address space. Uh, with yes. Your API. And yes, you can. Dirty tracking work there. <laughs> it's <laughs> done with MMU notifiers. So the okay. file system triggers basically a write protect on the pages at a certain point in its life cycle. The, the write protect flows through to the MMU notifiers, which is supposed to trigger the device to do another HMM range vault and then write protect the pages on the device. At that point, the file system is in control of the page, is guaranteed to be data stable because every element in the system has write protected it and then it goes on to do what it normally does. Okay. Yeah, and I guess just, you could do the same thing if the, if the data was migrated to device memory, right? Like there would still be an MMU notifier because it's still part of the um, virtual address space, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if, you try to, if you try to get user pages that like if the process decides to, like the, it, it gets migrated back, that's a migration event? It's supposed to be, but we'd also like it not to be. <laughs> that's 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 kind of the other piece of this. So like like when I said in the chat, let's stop talking about HMM. It it's kind of true because there's a lot of different facets here. So you've got what Felix and Daniel are talking about right now is migration of anonymous memory to zone device pages on a coherent GPU. Right, that's that's a very narrow facet. When we talk about HMM range fault, we talk about synchronizing a off CPU page table with the CPU page table. Um, right. When we talk about fileback stuff, it's a yet another different thing. When we talk about zone device and public, private, and all this other stuff, it's yet another different thing. Um, when you go into get user pages land, how that interacts with this mess is when you get user pages one of these special page types for DMA, let's say, you don't really want to copy it back to the CPU. You want to do DMA in place where it is right now. Right, and precisely. Uh, and we do want to go there. We do want to sort that mess out, but uh, can we do that like after 5.16 oh. closes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, this is why I say yeah, it's no, important I, I, to disambiguate yeah, no. all these pieces right. because you're only talking about this little chunk, migration of anonymous memory to zone device coherent pages. That's that's one very constrained thing. If you start to say HMM, it brings in all of this other mess that hasn't been sorted out. Um, yeah, and then maybe that's part of what's kind of holding up this code review because like, there's just so many questions raised that are not directly relevant for the code under review, but they're kind of scaring the people who are supposed to review it. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. I mean, we have to take a uh, have a clear position uh, on that, and you know, something of a plan. Right, because all these questions you've got here are not the one piece that you're talking about. Because you have good answers for most of this stuff. Like, how does IO two from zone device pages work? The answer is it doesn't. It migrates to CPU memory when you do any action that triggers IO. Done. That that's Simple. the story. That's the story for a device private. It's not what we want for a device public, right? Device I know public. it's not what you want, but that's what you have now. So as no, far no, as migration goes, series, you know, no, part of the patch, like the the purpose of the patch series is to, to introduce device public memory that can be migrated to device memory, but remain mapped in the CPU page table. You and, and so you still can't that, use get user private on that, right? You still can't use get user pages on that. Yeah, kind of memory that I think that's that's okay. Um, and that's what I said. The answer is you don't. You don't get to do I/O from these special pages because I see. Okay, because I/O implies get user pages. All right. Because it implies get user pages, and until you figure that mess out, you're stuck. Right. Okay. Unless your I/O comes from a driver that also supports HMM, right? Then it would get. No, you've said it. HMM again. So you've gone into the bucket of nastiness. Well, <laughs> there is a path that's not too I, terrible to enable HMM range fault to return DMAable memory that's not in the CPU page table or, or any other combination thereof. So drivers using HMM range fault have some sort of reasonable shot at doing something here. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking of the interaction of device public memory with HMM range fault. Well, any of the special memory types with HMM range fault, there are options, and they're all kind of the same. We would we would like to be able to return a DMA address from HMM range fault that's usable by the device that's doing the import, and deal with the the mess that that causes on the exporter side. Well, the thing is um, that is a lot easier with the device public memory we have in mind um, because it, we yeah. don't need a DMA address know. effectively. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. If you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great then. Then you can just change HMM range fault to, to return that uh, memory type as a PFN. Yeah. Okay, so I'll take another note for that. The, the, Matthew's question about, yeah, the, the, the device private public thing came in with HMM when, uh, when Jerome was uh, saying like, oh, well, this is, this is public means that the CPU can access it. Private means that only the GPU can access it. Well, I think it's a little bit more than that. When a, a, a device private page, when you install it in a PTE, the PTE, a CPU PTE, it can never be, it, th there's no memory there. It's just a swap PTE. That's, that's kind of the main distinction. When you get down to nuts and bolts, when you install a device private page, it goes in as a swap PTE, so the CPU can never ever touch because there's no memory behind it. There's no PFN behind it. A device public page gets installed like a DAX page. It gets installed as a, a dev map, right? Um, so it has a real PFN. It has coherent CPU access like DAX does. The distinction becomes more relevant when you get into the, the HMM range fault and get user pages world. Uh, as Felix points out, we can't do anything with the swap entry except call maybe call out to some kind of driver function. But when we get to a, a PTE with a zone device public, then we can just return the PFN because it's CPU memory and the, the importer can DMA map it and consume it like normal. So it's pretty good. Yeah. So I was sort of assuming that once we have device public, that, that the HMM range fault and the um, get user pages would be handled automatically. It sounds not like get some more work not get user pages. Not get user pages. You can do HMM range fault, but you can't right. do get user pages. The reason you can't do get user pages is that the the operating model of the GPU is going to assume that it can migrate at any time that memory to and from GPU pages. And depending on exactly what your GPU has done, there may be conditions where the, the migration is mandatory. Get user pages requires the memory to be pinned and immovable. It's like the interaction of, it's, it's like zone movable versus everything else. Like get user pages cannot return zone immovable memory. Okay. Yeah, th 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 this is always, this is always the problem with, the, the problem with public was like, we look, it works, except what, what if you do this? Oh, you can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? <laughs> like, oh. like, no, you, you, if, if, if the if public can't support it, then public can't, public can't exist. That's why public got ripped out. But the um, get user pages is 
we've got a lot of memory types now that don't work with get user pages. Zone movable, the DAX stuff. It's just the list seems to just keep growing, which is bad for you know people doing I/O, but it's the reality. Zone so, movable doesn't work for get user pages. No, nope, not for long term. Not for long term. Oh yeah, for long term. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean even long term is like is long long term long long term is basically a this is a to do that this is broken. Like, cause it, I mean, long term causes problems for everybody. But but actually, I, I, I don't want to go there because that's a whole other. We had a shouting match about this like two years ago. So I might uh, retract my statement about long term. <laughs> yeah, but there's an issue with get user pages that have been for a long time. Uh, so um, we're touching on it. We should touch on it more, but not let's not get blocked by it. Yeah, that's why I say you just don't get it. Just get user pages doesn't work for your stuff, and you have an easy path forward, and then come back later with some proposal about how can you marry these things. Okay. Yeah, I can see Matthew sitting there and wanting to have a proposal about that, but. No, no I, 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 I want to say something about zone move, but it's not relevant to this conversation. So let, let's, <laughs> let, let's let that drop. <laughs> okay. It's going to be an interesting discussion when it opens, but I hope it doesn't open in the middle of the HMM uh, patch set. There's a, it's, it's a minefield, uh, if you, as you've noticed, and so you have to be very specific about exactly what you want and and very and have good answers about the things that don't work and how those things that don't work don't break, don't aren't usable visible regression. Or don't matter. And you know, focus on matter. the thing that you're doing, just the narrow little thing that you're doing. Don't just say, oh, I'm gonna fix everything with HMM. It's too ambitious. Yeah. I think that's what Jerome yeah. ran into. It's just it's too ambitious. You need yeah. to have little narrow things. And like we deleted most of what HMM most of the stuff that was labeled HMM has been deleted. Yeah, from the code. The only thing left is HMM range fault. And Christoph has suggested we should delete the HMM from that name and call it something else. The only reason it hasn't been done is nobody's figured out what the something else is. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no such thing as device public memory. It, it doesn't exist. So uh, come with, come with a different name. <laughs> it was deleted because no one used it, and it nobody because no one used it, no one knew what it was. So we deleted all of it uh, when we did the HMM cleanup. At the same time, we deleted all the other HMM stuff. Well, uh, we're like I said, we're trying to add it back. Um, you might pick, like Dan is suggesting, you might pick a better name than device public. Yeah, okay. Yeah, pick yeah, pick something that's very narrowly focused, like because it because device public came and went and and died. And if you're trying, if you say we want to bring back this thing that everybody had no idea what it was, then you like you're gonna you're gonna spend all your time describing how this new thing is not that, and just like pick another name, um, and uh, and. Precisely describe exactly what you want and, the, and why 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 it can fit in and why it's not device public. Okay, then I don't know. Maybe defining a feature would be that it's coherent. So call it device coherent. Yeah. But so uh, and and Dan, did you have a specific name in mind? Oh no no. I I, I like to, I like to uh, complain about the, sh the shade color. I don't I don't I don't pick the paint. I just, <laughs> I just reserve the right to not like the color after you pick it. <laughs> Okay, so the tentative name is device coherent, and we can improve it from there. Device coherent sounds reasonable. Yeah, or yeah, device CPU memory or device, you know, something that implies something. That the CPU is involved. And private is all about there's no CPU mapping. And, right. You know, adding a few little comments around those little enums that explain that very crisply, like what the actual code difference is, would be a good good idea. When we're from crisp about comments. Yeah, like what like what I said, device private means yeah, the CPU is a swap PTE. I mean, it's it's kind of obvious once you read and digest everything, but from people from you know from Matthew's perspective, where he's just drive by trying to understand this stuff, it's not obvious. Yeah. Now we're touching on Dave uh, Chinner's ask here, uh, some actual documentation for the model. Yeah, I mean. It could be a document. It could be comments in the code. I'm not sure what the right answer is, um, but I think there is a general um, issue that, that that's like emphasized by the discussion we're having right now. That um, a lot of default system and memory management people um, don't really know what's going on, and so it has to be documented somewhere. And and we haven't since forever, so that is kind of an ongoing thing. Fixing get user pages and having all this stuff work coherently 
that's a challenge uh, that we should address. We should identify that. Maybe that's next year's uh, summit uh, summit uh, topic. <laughs> We've had a summit talk on get user pages and peer to peer DMA every year for the last five years, and why break you know, the tradition? <laughs> why break the tradition? Exactly. We should keep going. Uh, nobody yeah. should solve anything. That's how these things work. But that, that, I feel that, like we're getting. <laughs> I feel like we're getting dangerously close. Well, I feel like we're getting dangerously close to be able to fix something because the thing that has been missing for the last about two years is someone on the GPU side that wants to implement. Right? We 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 have half the solution. Like we have the RDMA side kind of sorted out, and we don't have anyone on the GPU side that's been willing to implement all the HMM pieces, do the zone device stuff, have the special memory types. So without that, there was no way to go forward. If you guys get your special memory types in and become the GPU side, then we can figure out how to bridge the two drivers together and with actual patches. But until there was both sides of the bridge, you can't build half a bridge. That's what Jerome tried to do. We tried to build half a bridge in the kernel and it all got deleted in the end. So, uh, well, so I wanted to bring up, talk about one of the things that uh, Felix put up on this slide. Um, he said GPU page tables can handle huge pages to make them one gig. Are there other sizes that GPUs might be interested in handling, like 64 kilobytes or uh, um, something so intermediate? I guess um, different GPUs can have different page table layouts. And even on our side, we've been discussing different page table layouts uh, to optimize uh, TLB performance and stuff like that. Um, I mean, two megabyte and one gigabyte is what our GPUs do right now. Um, there could be other GPUs that do different things. Um, also, we have. Um, some fragment handling that deals with TLBs, but that isn't really concerned with the page table layout. Um, but um, my point is, I think we want to avoid unnecessarily splitting and then rejoining huge pages when we do the migration to the device because, yeah, I don't think that's necessary. Why do you see migrations fail? Like, what does that mean? I'm not sure exactly what's happening. I've seen cases where uh, migrations of some pages fails mysteriously, and, and I'm not really sure I understand all the conditions that are in the migration helpers dealing with that. I think it had something to do with huge pages, but uh, I could have misread it. I'm wondering if, if someone knows something, like um, is, is there any known limitations for migrating uh, huge pages uh, right now, or uh, I don't know. It's something we need to look into. You think it's migrating back? It thought it needed a huge page and couldn't get one? It was a migration to the GPU, something that was presumably already a huge page on the CPU side. But isn't the, doesn't the same problem exist on the GPU side? You could be going to the GPU and you couldn't get a huge page, so you're supposed to, you'll have to fragment and maybe that doesn't um, work. Maybe, but that's not what I was seeing. I, it wasn't a problem with the allocation on the GPU side. It was a problem with the, the migration helper um, getting, like, collecting the CPU page. Oh, isn't there a weird sort of sketchy, racy thing in there where the the pages can be split uh, outside the MMAP block or some nonsense, and then it triggers some weird stuff? Maybe there's a little bug in that handling. Okay, could be. Hopefully, it will uh, uh, not just be the AMD uh, HMM uh, team uh, chasing these bugs in future. I mean, I'm not saying we should put in intentionally buggy stuff, but there is the community. Yeah, and I, I, I want to point out that the community has been uh, doing a lot of work on the HMM side more than we have, actually. <laughs> so yeah. I think we should acknowledge that. Okay. And for me, the benchmark is when John Corbett starts writing up uh, the details. Uh, that's when the bug is being hunted. So the second one here, replication of shared read-only pages on multiple devices. I saw a thread from someone else that wanted to do this for NUMA localities within a process, and Linus shot it down pretty hard. <laughs> I I don't. I wouldn't bring that up. Let's say you know, in in you're trying to get your very narrow thing merged. Maybe yeah. just, uh, what was that specifically? Uh, I don't remember the thread. I just saw it go by and kind of read and thought, oh, that's interesting. But it was it was exactly this concept that, that you can duplicate like glibc, like in a, in a NUMA context, forget GPUs. It would make perfect sense to have your glibc pages duplicated on the NUMA nodes. 
yeah. uh, so that every new node is doing cache local access or DRAM local access of, of glibc. Uh, so and what, 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 we've, what we've found is um, there is a certain CPU, which I, I, I shall not name, um, that is very, very bad about ca instruction caches um, across Numa nodes. Um, so it, 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 it has, let's just say it has weak caching, um, particularly for iCache. And so what people are looking to do is replicate text pages between um, different Numa nodes. Um, so if, if, if you want to do it properly, uh, you actually need to have separate, completely separate page tables for different threads running at accessing the same code. Um, what, what you can do to kind of simulate that is to map the same, it's, it's to actually copy <laughs> the code. So I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to copy the code, right? You, you, you can do um, essentially a super cow where you not copy on right, but copy on fault, where you, you say, okay, I'm willing to sacrifice basically any amount of DRAM for this. And so anytime that I, uh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll map this and then copy it out of the page cache into a local to this NUMA node allocated page um, on every fault. And so you you map the, let's say you've got four NUMA nodes, you map the uh, the library four times, and then you then if, if you're on node zero, you, you access one, if you're node one, you access, a, you, you, you actually, you, you do your fix ups in such a way that you, you end up branching to a completely different um, uh, location in memory that you've arranged is going to be on your local node. Uh, so, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> well, the same way the cow does. God. Well, no, you said you have multiple copies, so you actually want the yeah. you actually want the instructions, the, the instruction pointers, and the different CPUs to be pointing at different addresses, even though they're running in the same function. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, you do it like, you, you do it all in the linker, um, because you already have, um, uh, you, 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 when, when you make a function call to a library, you, the, the, yeah, it doesn't, go, yeah. Right, it goes through the PLT, but PLT, you're right. the PLT is global too, so. You need okay, to I, I, I admit I didn't delve into that part of it. I, I was just assured that it works, and they only wanted it for libraries. They didn't need it for the main program uh, text. And I said, okay, because I okay. don't like I don't like to know how linkers work. That doesn't sounds, make me happy. <laughs> sounds scary, but so maybe something like that would work here. Uh, and just I mean, the other thing on this list, the P two P H M clients. I, I think that's straightforward. Just just let the let the pages go through. Um, they're blocked. Just let them go through. No problem. Um. No, for device private, I think you do need to. Oh, oh sorry, for device private. Yes, for device private. So what I was kind of thinking about would be reasonable here is if we could have a way to link uh, uh, a callback, perhaps through page map or some other thing, so that when HMM hits the private page and it knows it's doing a DMA map and a whole bunch of other stuff, it could then call the callback and the callback could return the DMA adder T and then everything can work out for you. I, again, this is one of these things where we could, we could try to make patches to do this if there was somebody on the other side and, and the only people I think are using device private right now is, is Nouveau and does the AMD driver use it? I don't remember. Yes. So maybe we should try to actually popularize this simple thing first so that we can address that hard thing. And uh, other thing I wanted to throw in there is that kind of callback is maybe a way to go at fixing get user pages, or maybe that's I'm just opening a can of worms there. I, so let's, let's you know, yeah, small, let's small steps, right? So, so if, if you have a driver that could do a DMA map for device private page. If, if the MD driver is in that state, then yes, let's start let's start talking about patches about how that would plumb through, um, you know, how that would plumb through so that we could make that work. Because that's, that's a straightforward. This is where Jerome had been driving at for a long time. We've had many, many debates about where to put the callback, but in the current arrangement, I would say put it in the PG map. And um, it's probably like, uh, aside from the driver work to make the bar one mapping realized, or sorry, the, the GPU bar mapping realize 
uh, I think it's minor, like it's probably 100 lines in the HMM file and, and maybe a couple lines in the RDMA side to, to fix that up. I'm going to press you on details later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, the yeah. Uh, the, the other sticky bit that keeps coming up, but I feel like Christoph has been worn down, is that he doesn't like DMA mapping bar memory. Okay. Uh, but everybody's been doing it anyway, and we've got like the Habana Labs driver that wants to do it now and is probably going to be merged. We've got the AMD drivers already doing it and so forth. So I think he's just kind of... Yeah. It's a whole new world given up on that one. So I think we're okay. I don't know. I haven't heard a crisp opinion there, but anytime you do this, you're taking bar memory and you're putting in a DMA map and you're sending it to with the, yeah, exactly like Dan says with the P2P stuff. Uh, Logan has a patch series that's, that's working to clean that up that you just posted another version of. However, it has the underlying assumption that there will be zone device memory P2P pages backing all of this. So, it, if that win, turns out to be the winning approach, then a GPU driver will have to create those zone pages for its bar. And when it has a device private page, it'll have to return the zone P2P page instead. And then it kind of works through naturally, which is another way to kind of approach this. Okay, so a meta thing here is we're getting close to the end of the time. And I think the discussion is just getting going um yeah a lot of the discussion is kind of the future stuff uh, on this slide yeah and some things i mean we spent exactly a lot of time talking about future stuff even before i got to the slide um like i skipped over the slide for our immediate goals because i don't think we even have the right people in here <laughs> that who, who have been raising concerns on our code review yeah um, so what I think what we, we want good, we i think we got some good um advice here um renaming the device public to maybe a device coherent uh, adding comments in, in some strategic places to kind of uh, help people understand what we're doing and then how this is all supposed to work. Well, the the other question to ask is what Matthew asked. Why is device public a zone device at all? And if you can if you can define that and answer that, I think people will be a lot happier. Okay. Oh. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to try and draw some big, bold lines around what we're trying to accomplish in this patch set and where we think it might go in the future, <laughs> what we think is practical to do in the 5.16 timeframe. Yeah, you you've still got another eleven minutes to. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The rest of the memory. Yeah, I just saw it. Uh, <laughs> saw the uh, uh, limit ap approaching, so I thought I'd flag that. So let's go right back into whatever seems interesting. So Dan asks about the Newman node problem, and I know people have researched putting this on Newman nodes, and I don't know why they didn't like it, but I do know they didn't like it. Um, I think the, the precursor system to Frontier used NUMA nodes, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think if you're talking about NUMA nodes, are you talking about um, managing your device memory in the Linux page allocator? The, body allocator? Yeah, the suggestion is you, you have a CPU-less NUMA node that represents the GPU and you hang all of your GPU memory off of the CPU-less NUMA node and then mumble, 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 something, something, something. Okay. It sounds bad, but what was the specific reason that got shot down? I don't remember. No, it didn't. It was done. If I remember properly, it was done on Summit. Yeah, and then we, I think we did actually consider doing something like that for Frontier. And um, the concern was that you'll have the GPU driver competing with CPU NUMA code for the same memory. And, and we're just really too used to having the GPU driver manage the GPU memory, right? And I, I don't think we could wrap our heads around how this will work. Um, like HMM uh, a couple of years ago was really just a, um, 
like a niche use case. I mean, it's becoming a lot more important now, but uh, maybe as yeah. the memory model and then the programming model evolves, this is becoming more feasible. It still sounds like bad idea to repurpose uh, Numa. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I think this has to be solved in the in in, in the well, uh, I mean, device it, memory model. It, it, it kind of makes sense for some architectures. Like, say, if you have memory, uh, sorry, if you have systems with gigantic GPUs and lots of GPU memory, like even maybe more than system memory, why would you want that memory go unused when you're you have an application that's not using the GPU, right? Mm -hmm. If that's just a NUMA node, you can allocate that with malloc from from your uh, CPU code, right? This certainly is a kind of NUMA. That's not in doubt. Yeah. Does anyone know what the CXL guys are doing for their kind of byte addressable, almost as fast as memory devices, but that aren't actually memory devices? Are they keeping it on zone device? Are they putting on a new node or are they just mixing it with normal memory? Anybody know? I think Dan will answer. Uh, Dan is the experts here, yeah. Yeah, I hope he'll answer in the chat. He's listening. Well, we can, that that might be a good one to take offline. Okay, so um, I think we're pretty much done here. We could uh, move on to. Uh, Chit chat, <laughs> not related to HMM at all. Yeah, or we have more time for questions. I mean, um, this yeah, has been question. a discussion between Jason and Matthew and us. And I don't know if the graphics people are just completely overwhelmed by the discussion, or if there are questions we can answer in the remaining few uh, five minutes or so. Yeah. So anyone on the uh, on the chat, and there are uh, some fifty three uh, people in uh, on the stream, uh, is welcome to unmute and uh, and jump in. Otherwise, I'm going to let my camera point at my electric VTOL project here on the uh, <laughs> desk beside me. <laughs> And uh, that's actually going to get some GPU content in it because my dream is to um, is to do some computational fluid dynamics uh, simulation uh, on my desktop as part of getting that uh, that airplane flying. Okay, so um, that uh, that is our uh, our time for now. So uh, I will officially declare an end uh, to the mini conference. Is that uh, is that does that work for you, Felix? Yeah. Um. Thank you very much, Jason. Yeah. Thanks. And Daniel. Felix, Daniel. Jason. Dan, the Matthew. fourth Dan of today, <laughs> Willie as well. Yeah, um, I learned a lot and have absolutely no input into any of what you've just said. <laughs> it's not like pictures, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as soon as you said file systems, my eyes kind of glazed over, if I'm honest. Um, I think that was when the, the sugar rush from the Lamington also really uh, started tailing off. Yeah, I have uh, an ulterior motive in getting that file system stuff resolved because I have this file system called Tux3 out there that I would like to get merged. It's still worth merging, and one of the blockers is exactly in this part. It's the interaction between uh, actually RDMA and uh, and movable memory. So it's very much the same ballpark. And uh, I intend to get into that, but definitely not in the context of this 
uh, device memory migration. Yeah, so zone movable is definitely a lot closer to my heart since I, you know, usually end up playing in this size world and CMA is a thing. So here we all are. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was going on and uh, I started it with my speculation that this stuff is actually going to migrate down to devices that size. And I don't think that's facetious. I think we are actually going to see vision and AI uh, applications at that scale that are using this kind of memory sharing. I know a lot of the embedded devices that I've, I'm familiar with, they, they just have coherent, a, a, a single pool of coherent memory. And so they don't they don't have this problem, right? It's just all memory. It's all normal pages. There's no issue. You don't have the issue that we're facing is effectively a, a distillation of the NUMA problem, just with a GPU instead of a CPU. And if you don't have NUMA because your system's so small, you don't have the problem in the first place. Yeah, but those systems keep getting bigger even when they're small. <laughs> they do, but NUMA usually comes out when you have to have multiple dies. If you have single die, you can uh -huh. often avoid the NUMA issue. So I don't know if we'll see embedded with chiplets, multiple chiplets for the compute side. And I don't know. But... To be fair, no one can fab them anyway. So we've bought ourselves a couple <laughs> of years there. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right. Well, on that note, um, yeah, I guess a lot's going to follow up on. Linux MM and DRI Devel and AMD graphics and all scattered over everywhere. Um, if someone could please help fill in some of the shared notes, that would um, be super helpful. And, and Matt, you do that. Yeah, I, I was taking notes there. A lot of them are incomplete, uh, but I can also go back and listen to the recorded stream again and, and flash that out. Uh, I've also volunteered perhaps foolishly to attack the uh, documentation issue and as Felix says that is something we can do in the code because we can put um, metadata in the code that gets automatically translated into documents like the HMM uh, document so that uh, is something I think we should we should do. Uh, and we can start with some like wrong documentations and let the uh, brilliant minds out there turn it into a uh, right, uh, right documentation. If somebody wants an interesting task, it might be to build a, a proper KDoc for for this set of APIs, like Matthew did for X-Ray, where you where you have the kind of the the pros about how it works and so forth, and then you have the KDoc linking to the actual functions, and you kind of organize yeah. it in a nice yeah that's nice, and then. Get rid That's of what I meant. RST. I haven't got the terminology because I haven't tried it myself, but uh, but soon will. Okay. Um, my hands up either. was to uh, Daniel. I'm going to send you Daniel Phillips. I'm going to send you what I have, and then maybe you can distill that with your notes. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, and Jason, and see you yeah. later, Felix. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. And yeah, we've now um, got ourselves another 15 minutes um, to refill sugar levels or whatever. And um, then starting from quarter past the hour, um, Jason Ekstrand's going to be taking us through our final talk. So enjoy. So you should now have a, a button down by mute to share your screen. Aha, share my screen. Um, yep. While you do that, um, yeah, welcome back into the last bit of the, the break. Um, I spent the 15 minutes trying to think of the synchronization joke and the best I can come up with is that all the memory management stuff paged it out of my brain. Um, so with that, Jason, <laughs> going to be talking about um, synchronization, why we have more sync objects than memory management has page tracking structures and arrays, um, and why all of them are useless to an extent. So yeah, you've got 45 minutes to sum up, I think about 800 mails on DRI Devel, and good luck. It's okay, I timed this talk and I can do it in 12. So we can, should have plenty of time for discussion. 
Um, I can't sum everything up in 12, but I can go through the slides that fast. Um, so first of all, some special blame. Um, I should blame Daniel Stone for making me give this talk on very short notice. And I'm going to blame Daniel Vetter for agreeing with him and not stopping him. And yeah. Um, so if things are a bit rough, I'm sorry. Um, Why did I just get muted? Yeah, there you are. Sorry. Did you hear me before? Or was I muted then? Uh, we lost you after blaming both Daniels. Okay, so both Daniels are properly blamed. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about the current status of GPU synchronization in Linux. Um, so depending on what parts of the graphics stack you work on, you may have seen any or all of these different synchronization primitives. And this is not a complete list. Um, the point of the slide is just to tell you that there are a killer of a lot of them and they're everywhere and every API seems to have a minimum of three. Um, good news is that inside the kernel, everything here is struck DMA fence. Um, with the single exception of X shem fence, but that's kind of its own beast. Um, basically everything in the kernel is struck DMA fence in some way, shape or form. Um, implicit synchronization is done through DMA reservation object, which is a container of struck DMA fence. Uh, sync objects are a pointer to a struct DMA fence and a lock. Uh, timeline sync objects are a struct DMA fence that happens to be a DMA fence chain, etc. Everything's a struct DMA fence. Um, so for those of you who aren't extremely familiar with this, um, basically it's a structure which represents a potentially future event, uh, has a Boolean signaled state, and a bunch of helpers to allow you to wait on it and things like that. Um, there are two particular guarantees that we're concerned with for the purposes of this discussion. Uh, one is that it's one shot, i.e. once you've signaled it, it's signaled forever for the lifetime of the object. And the other is we have this guarantee that they have to be signaled in finite time once they've been exposed. And exposed is kind of a hand wavy thing because there's some fun stuff that you can do as long as you keep it inside your driver. But the moment you've given it to user space or given it to some other driver, you have to signal it in finite time. Um, and this guarantee has a bunch of important implications. Uh, first of all, you can't have any circular dependencies because then you would deadlock. Um, nothing which is required for signaling one of these is allowed to fail. So that takes out a bunch of locks and it means you down to GP, no weight and atomic if you want to allocate memory. Um, if you're on a GPU and you have a hardware fault of any sort, the standard solution is you reset the chip, kill the user space, and signal all the associated fences. Um, that way the fence, the fences at least signal even if the user space context dies. Um, and, but these guarantees have the very, very nice upshot that you can wait on a struct DMA fence, not anywhere, but in a lot of places. So it can block swapping, it can block buffer migration, it can block, block the shrinker. Um, very, very useful. Um, but the problem is that user space isn't happy with this. User space wants more control. Um, so a couple of examples of this, AMD and Intel, um, and ARM as well, all have some sort of plans to sidestep the kernel. Um, I'm not going to speak to AMD or ARM's plans, but Intel's plans run something along these lines. Basically, uh, the kernel driver still manages memory, um, and any sort of global resources. Uh, it tells the, the user space tells the kernel what resources it wants to be resident in memory at any given time and where to map them into its page tables. And then user space submits its batches directly to firmware without the kernel really knowing what's going on. Um, in theory, this should be faster, lower latency, um, and all sorts of other good things. Um, like I said, Andy and ARM have similar plans. Uh, and Intel, we have a prototype of this we've been calling ULLS. Uh, we're using it in a compute driver today. It used to work on upstream, but then we had to kill it due to the fence issues we're talking about here. Um, we have a non upstream kernel branch where ULS is being used for with pretty good success. Um, another example of where things kind of fall apart um, is that high performance clients want more of a timeline model. So this was the number one feature request that we, i.e. Kronos, got for Vulkan early on. People were not happy with those semaphores and fences, and they wanted a timeline model. Um, so we have this timeline semaphore extension, which basically gives them a sequence number thing. You have a 64-bit integer. 
um, to signal it, you set a higher value. To wait on it, you wait for the value to be greater than or equal to some target. And you can wait from the GPU or the CPU you can signal from either. Um, <clears throat> and this kind of replaces the old stuff that we had. Um, this looks a lot like what we do inside drivers today. You know, you write a sequence number, you trigger an interrupt, and that's the way most of the synchronization works. It's also the same model that game developers are getting on DPD-12. Um, and I believe it's the same model they're getting on most of the consoles today as well. Um, game developers absolutely love it. One of the big reasons is it lets, is it's a lot better for multi-threaded engines. And I could go into that, but I am not going to go into details there. Um, they come with a few caveats, though. Uh, one of those caveats is that you have wait before signal. So um, client can submit, can submit some work that signals semaphore A to set it to value seven, and then later, and then, but before that work actually gets even submitted, much less happens, it submits some other work to wait on it to hit timeline value seven, and we're responsible for sorting out the dependencies. Um, of course, if the client is allowed to specify arbitrary timeline values, it can deadlock, that's okay. Vulcan is perfectly fine with clients doing all sorts of nasty things to themselves, and that's just their fault. As long as the system stays standing, we don't care. Um, we have an emulation of this for the AMD and Intel drivers that uses DRM sync object, but it is not really as efficient as we'd like it to be. It's not really the, emulate, the implementation we would like long term. Um, the third example of where this kind of falls apart is that compute doesn't happen in finite time. So in 3D space, everything computes in less, completes in less than a second, typically, because your monitor refresh rate is 60 hertz or higher. There's a lot of stuff that's higher these days. Um, anything that runs below 20 hertz is unplayable. So, you know, most stuff does compute in a fairly short amount of time. In the compute world, this isn't at all true. Uh, the GPU is just another processor with a bunch of cores. A uh, compute job could take forever. Why shouldn't a single shader run on the GPU for three days? Um, so there's no real concept of finite time there anymore. Uh, currently, the way this is dealt with is either drivers cheat behind the kernel's back and just don't do DMA fences somehow, or uh, the jobs have to chop their work up into smaller pieces in order to avoid hang, at hang timers, or um, it just doesn't work properly. We don't really have a good solution for that yet, and that's part of why we're having this discussion. OK, so what, what does the glorious future look like? Um, my vision of the glorious future, personally, is what I'm calling user-space memory fences, which is basically copy and paste of timeline semaphores only in memory. So you have some bit of CPU mappable memory, and it's either 64 or 32 bits, depending on your needs. and Signaling is done by writing to memory and signaling an interrupt, just like you would do for internal synchronization within your kernel driver. Um, and this might happen as part of an IOPTL, or users might want space might, like, ah, user space might want to do this itself. Um, I want to allow for that. Uh, CPU weights are similar to Futex. Um, I don't know that we can actually reuse Futex, but you know, some sort of an IOPTL that waits on that bit of memory to change values to something useful. And then GPU weights. Basically, the whatever your exact IOPTL is, it takes this pointer, and it takes target value, and it waits. And that's your synchronization model. Um, no more sync objects, no more implicit synchronization. Everything happens by just writing memory values and waiting on memory values. Um, this would basically give us timeline semaphores exactly the way that they're intended to work. Uh, this is basically what Microsoft does with monitor defense. Um, but it has a lot of problems. And there's a lot of other different models that have been discussed. Um, there's long, long, long mail threads with AMD and Intel and a bunch of other people talking about a number of different models for user space controlled synchronization primitives, but they all fall flat because they all have the same problems. So I don't want to go over all the models because they all have the same problems, but this is the model that I've been working with personally and where I would like to see things go. Um, so the actual future is a little more grim than what I've said would be beautiful and wonderful. Um, why? Well, the short version is that none of the user space works this way. So all of user space uses all of these sync objects and sync files, and they all tie back to DMA fence. And DMA fence requires finite time, and we can't guarantee that with uh, 
memory fences or with any sort of user space controlled fence. Um, so why don't we have an obstructed memory fence? That's what I just said. Um, yeah, so we could wrap it and obstruct the EMA fence and user space might just never bother to signal it or it might signal it wrong. Like if we're depending on writing memory and then firing an interrupt, it might forget the interrupt. Um, user space might deadlock itself. Uh, okay, so we can't trust user space, we know that. So let's throw a timeout on it. That should work, right? Um, well, the problem is that user space can't trust either, us either. So let's assume user space submits a bunch of jobs with an atypical dependency graph, everything should sort out as far as it's concerned. Um, we as the kernel have absolutely no idea what that graph looks like. We have no visibility into it whatsoever. All we know is that user space probably has done something acyclic. And we might want to do something like, say, move memory. That's something that we do all the time. Um, these operations add dependencies to this graph. The moment you add dependencies to an acyclic graph without understanding what the original graph is, you have the possibility of adding cycles. And then your cycle causes a deadlock, and this causes the fence to time out, and we kill the user space context. Awesome. We protected ourselves, and user space kept the pieces, except user space didn't do anything wrong in this scenario. And I think it's very easy to construct these scenarios. Um, but the important thing is that user space does something that it thinks is 100% correct, and it gets killed because we added a dependency without understanding the graph. So how do we, how do we break this? Um, the best solution that anybody has come up with so far is to separate memory and execution synchronization. Um, so basically, you keep doing memory management with all the DMA fund stuff we have today. Um, Kernel does dependency tracking with DMA fans. We use TTM, all of those useful things. Um, it doesn't look that different. What looks different is that any sort of synchronization, execution synchronization, so user space to user space, um, that happens vis a vis user space fences. And the important thing is the kernel never waits on a user space fence. Um, if the kernel ever needs to do something like, say, move memory, it preempts the con context, all the contexts that are touching it. It knows that because we've told it what is resident and what isn't. Um, moves the memory and restores the context. As long as you preempt happens in finite time, you can block a DMA fence on it, so that's fine. Um, this depends on preemption in order to work, but all the big GPUs, uh, AMD, Intel, NVIDIA support preemption at these days at enough granularity that this is probably tractable. Um, so we can implement this. And this is what we're doing effectively right now for ULLS. Um, well, not quite, but it's where we're headed. Um, and we're pretty sure this is implementable and it works. Um, OK, so we should do that. This leads us to the interop problem. So one of the problems with this solution is that um, kernel can never wait on a user space memory fence. We can never turn one of these things into a DMA fence. And as I mentioned before, everything in the window system, everything that's any sort of client to client interrupt, uh, OpenCL to OpenGL, anything with EGL, uh, Wayland, X11, all depends on implicit sync, sync files, or something of that ilk. Um, it all depends on DMA fence under the hood. So, <sighs> What are our options? Um, where I sit, what I've seen so far, we have basically three options. One, we can replumb absolutely everything. Uh, this includes all the kernel drivers need to separate memory and execution synchronization. Um, we need a new user space facing synchronization primitive. We need all of our user space drivers to switch to this synchronization primitive. We need all of the distros to ship all of the new things and we can build a new world. Um, option two is that we just wait and use the space before passing it off to another process. This solves all our deadlock problems. Um, when somebody does VKQ present to send it off to X11, we just sit there in a user space thread until the rendering is done and then we hand it to X11. So it solves all the deadlock problems. Um, we don't have any cross-process synchronization because we're just waiting in user space, but that also means that all the cross-process pipelining that we've spent so much effort to try and build um, is just gone. 
And it also totally breaks Wayland in a couple of corner cases. Um, option three is find somebody more clever than me who can come up with a better option. So that's the end of my very quick uh, bullet train rundown. Um, and I will open the floor to suggestions or objections or other comments. Yeah. Um... Long story short, I've sent out a proposal for option number three roughly six months ago. Um, but Daniel basically torn it apart as, okay, uh, there's a lot of open ends and a lot of implementation needs to be done here. Um, basic idea is you can still wait inside the kernel, but not inside any shrinker callback or anything like that, only in the top of the IO control when the command submission comes in. Partly solves your problem, but not completely, <laughs> no. That sounds um, a lot like my wait in user space solution. Exactly, it's, it's basically the same as wait in user space. It just moves the wait a bit further to the to the command submission. Um, it's, uh, the good news is you don't, then don't wait on uh, before you interrupt with this other application. Uh, but you then wait when the other application finally submits something to the kernel. And we could avoid that wait or could um, yeah, I think we, we could still make uh, most of those weight solve up in its in itself. <laughs> how to, I, I have no idea how to explain that in English. <laughs> yeah, I think so. To be clear, the, the first proposal was essentially let's deal with this in the kernel by moving all this Windows system stuff down there. Um, it, <laughs> it, it's actually easier for, for us to rewrite all of our implementations than for that to happen. <laughs> well, I think one complication that, that's maybe in the room here is, well, was maybe a bit lost, but I, I think we can't ignore it. That, we still have like one subsystem, even for the tiny garbage CPUs, uh, GPUs. So I, I don't think we can ever get rid of DMA fence for sync. Because yeah, they, there's, there's going to continue it. Like, like the big desktop GPUs, they, they all going to ha have preemptive various varying levels of, of usefulness and, and maybe page folds on the hardware side of varying levels of usefulness. But like the, the tiny ones, like realistically, I think the, the only sync you get there is an end of uh, indirect buffer. So I, I think that's, that's another complication. It, it we need to on... keep that part working. Depends on how you define tiny, though, because you know Mali, Mali Gen Ten um, scales down quite a long way, and they still have. We don't have the details yet, but yeah, just it's, it's pointing firmly in that direction, and you know that that's going down into to SBC. So, you know, beyond that, in terms of GPU, all you have is verisilicon. Vivante, who knows what they're doing, and also IMG, who have historically really closely kept up with Vulcan. So I can't imagine they'd be doing something which precluded doing uh, timeline semaphores pretty efficiently. I, I think it's less about that and more about like you can't get rid of DMA fence ever because no matter what the GPU, if it's a huge AMD or Intel discrete one, you know, people are still going to try and run X11 on it. And who's, <laughs> you know, obviously I have opinions on that, right? But like, who's going to go rewrite Zorg? Oh, yeah. 
Well, so I mean, even if all the GPUs move there, there's, there's the next thing coming up with all these AI thingies. And right now, they very much look like GPUs from 20 years ago in some cases. Yep. So, like, people love to just chop these things off because, hey, who needs them? <laughs> well, and even, I mean, even though we can't, even if you have a nice GPU in your system, we can't guarantee that you're not going to plug in some random USB display link device, which is going to have its own set of issues and throw a wrench in the works. It's not a GPU, it's just a display pipe. Yeah, but it still takes yeah, but... DMA buffs with DMA fences. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> I mean, even the consumer can screw it up. Yeah, basically, um, we have a combination of very old GPUs, very new GPUs, very old uh, uh, desktop environments like X11, very new desktop environments like Valent, and all of them need to be keeping working together. That's the situation we are into. So, basically, throwing anything of that part completely away and not have compatibility to it is not an option in my opinion. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I do think probably the most realistic one is, is something like what Christian's done or, or like some other way to carry around user memory fences in the existing container object but, but probably with a lot more opt-in-ness because I, I guess on the compositor side, you probably want to like deal with the user mode fences in the compositor, maybe. So, like, yeah. Yeah, I, d I don't think there's, there's any way around that. And that's fine, you know, we've got to do it and we're already, no one's really thrilled that you can DOS your entire desktop right now just by passing the fences which don't complete until GPU reset kicks in. Like, so, that's a problem we've got to solve full stop. One of the other places where this all gets hairy is it's, it's all well and good to say the compositors will figure out how to deal with it, but that means the driver needs to decide what it's going to use internally based off of what the compositor is able to deal with, or we just throw away all the old compositors. And in the Vulkan world, we create the device, we configure stuff, you can start- It's just a Vulkan bug. No, it's not a Vulkan bug. Vulkan was designed properly. <laughs> it's OpenGL and X that were designed backwards. Um, Everyone else is wrong. <laughs> but you can start up, you can start rendering, and it's not until you actually go to present the first time that we know, oh crap, I have to be able to deal with DMA fences. And at that point, I can't swap my implementation out from under me. I mean, wait a second. Um, drivers, new drivers dealing with DMA fences is not much of a problem. The problem comes in when you have old stuff dealing with new user space fences, because you can always wait for a DMA fence, but you have a very limited point where you can wait for user fences. So um, when you have new hardware and uh, no, when you have old hardware and new compositor, it will basically always work. But if you have new hardware and old components like old uh, compositors or um, old X11, um, then we have a problem. That much we all agree on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, I guess the the other thing is also when we when we stuff it into containers is, like, g given that implicit sync is is like not not very popular, I, I don't think we should like make implicit sync into a container for user mode fences if we can at all avoid it. That that sounds like complete horror. Um, there's another problem that we need to throw out here, which is it's all well and good to say we can go write new compositors. I'm, I'm happy to hear that, but 
most of us have to deal with Android, and Android is built ground up on SyncFile. And convincing Google to go rewrite Android sounds like a more challenging prospect. I, well, A, it's objectively easier than X11. B, <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> is that a scale we, we want to really put into the picture? Like, you know, here's all the reasonable things, and then it's maybe Google, and I can't even see X. <laughs> like, it's on the other continent. Oh my God, you can tell it's getting into the European evening, right? Um, but no, seriously, like, so X11 isn't a gigantic problem in and of itself. It's the implementation of Zorg, which is the really difficult bit. Um, but yes, Android is built fundamentally around sync file, but that's a property of their implementation rather than something that's surfaced all the way through. So they do have the ability, like if they have the will, they have the ability to, to go break it. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's Marley and Snapdragon for them. So, um, depending on what Qualcomm ends up doing with future hardware, they might be pushed to a point where they have to deal with it anyway. Um, even though I'm pretty sure they have the option of throwing the thread under the bus on the client side, which we can't do on Waven because that's what breaks the synchronization. Um, where the client assumes it has one thread to send messages on and that when you do VKQ present, certain things will get sent down the wire to Wayland, which is why we can't take that option. Android could. Um, but yeah, the, the problem for generic Linux is more that we, we surface them as API forever. Like, well, so, I, I think that's the difficult bit as opposed to Android, where it's a thing that the platform's built around, but the platform's much more mutable. So, I, I haven't started the DRI Devil thread on this, but I, th I think the reason why Android gets away with, with all this is that they don't have memory management for GPU buffers. So, their, their DMA fence is actually just the synchronization fence which completely kills us because we have a dma fence as an ad fence on atomic commit and i recently well one of years ago or well, one year ago i added a bunch of annotations and it it's unfixable as in like as a, as a display driver this just a bunch of locks you have to take from random other subsystems like I square C or whatever. And they happily do allocations underneath there. And and in a pure Android world, uh, you just don't care because the DMA fence is only ever a, a synchronization fence and never a memory fence. Throwing a really bad straw man out there. Um, That's all we've we... got, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I'd just join in. Um, if we, yeah, assume that someone's going to buy an AMD GPU 10 years in the future and they still want to run Zorg on it, would it be the worst thing for... <clears throat> so they're still running the user space which is reliant on DMA fence would it be the worst thing for any CS? No, it can't be any CS which exports DMA fence. Any CS which depends on a DMA fence to, um, to block returning from the CS IOPTL until that fence is retired. I mean, it's not going to be quick, but if you're using ancient user space on insanely modern hardware, then it'll probably still be fast enough. I mean, that, that's essentially the plan that we touch all the drivers who care. Well, which pretty much means all of them and uh, do the same, th like 
sync sync object has it already has already to give me the sync object and there's annotation in there to make sure you're not holding any locks so it doesn't deadlock uh, we essentially need to add the same for sync uh, sync file and if we really want to keep this working with implicit sync which is just a horror show we have to do the same thing there and i don't even have an idea how to do it but then yeah then then essentially you if if you get a user mode fence and you submit it to something old that does DMA fence or end of end of command submission, uh, batch buffer, uh, IB, whatever you call it, DMA fence, then you just block before you grab blocks. Well, block with a timeout probably. But that means like changing all the drivers, which also sounds like stupid. You're breaking up a lot, Tristan. Yeah, you're gone. It's probably using X11. <laughs> um, well, we're going to yeah, go back. I, I did have a, a different, completely terrible idea for how to deal with X11. And that is that present already uses X shem fence. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. Can we make X shem fence a wrap around a user space memory fence and signal it from the GPU? I. It means X will block on the GPU work before it sets up its blit. But maybe that's good enough. Oh my god! Uh, I never considered about. I never considered that at all because I spent five years raging at action fence for being useless and misconceived and everything that's wrong with everything. But just I was ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, so the, honestly, the biggest thing about keeping existing stacks working, I think is the implicit thing sync we have going on between everything. Like sometimes, mostly even in like in the same process, like you, you, you grab an EGL image and throw it at Libya or whatever, or at compute, all these things. Not, none of these APIs, as far as I know, pass around any kind of explicit stuff yeah. at all. So there's nothing we can attach to except we 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 go and make DMA reservation and D, uh, locking even more fun. Well, most of yeah. the stuff like each I don't want to do that. Assumes <laughs> some sort of a underlying shared EGL implementation, which we do have control over. Um. Now, that control is entirely built on top of kernel implicit sharing, but we could, in theory, replumb EGL. I don't know how that works with libba and some of those other less EGL-friendly things, but we could, in theory, replumb a bunch of user space to do things differently. Um, there's always going to be the random clients that know about DMA buff export and import and do it themselves. And those we don't have a way to fix. I mean, for the backwards compact, I mean, I think another option is if uh, on, on like a per context level or whatever, we, we do a backwards compatibility mode. And I mean, that, that that's, I think essentially what AMD is currently aiming for with a bit of hardware help, but I think you don't even need to a lot of hardware help, especially if you don't care about performance that much. So I, I think the entire backwards combat thing we can also solve with, we, we, we run the driver stack in the DMA fence mode, except Jason insists that he can't decide which one he needs. And I don't think that. Okay, needs to drop again. Yeah, we lost him again. Oh, well. I I don't think that things like OpenGL, OpenCL, interop allow for that either. 
Um, you don't start up OpenCL on a display. You start up your GL driver on a display, and then you do some magic calls and stuff happens. That, that extension is just horrible to start with. But um, your OpenCL driver starts up with absolutely no knowledge whatsoever about your Windows system, and then there are extensions to allow it to interoperate with GL using implicit sync because everything is EGL and awesome. Um, and there's no way for the CL driver when it starts up to know that it's going to need to run in DMA sense mode. Well, I mean, that, that's what, like, uh, we start up in, in user mode, friends mode, and then at any so, time you use an extension that is stupid and old, we punch out the entire thing underneath you. Yeah, so CL, you can do that. You can just swap it. You can just flush everything, replace all your objects, switch over to a completely different implementation if you want to. And if I if I remember CLGL interoperate, right, I'll be pleased if I don't, to be honest. It's, you know, again, it doesn't give you all of the primitives. It's just, you have two implementations, they're coherent somehow, you share some stuff, and then under the hood sharing occurs. So you could do the kind of opaque FD solution by, um, by plumbing through there. I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything in CLGL interop which literally requires DMA reservation. No, you could, you could share a socket if you wanted to and pass data back and forth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it, it doesn't work like that right now. Yeah, it doesn't that, work that's like, this, this, this goes back to option one of replumbing all of user space. Um, oh, so for the- Slightly more contained maybe. For, for the walking case, like, why can't we just punch out everything? Um, because for one thing, they may have a bunch of pre-constructed objects and we don't have a table of all semaphores that were created, for instance. Um, we don't have that list, so we can't go and construct it. And we're strongly discouraged from taking locks all over the universe to maintain those lists. Um, the oh. bigger problem is that with timeline semaphores, we have no notion, even as the user space driver, when it's going to complete. So we can't flush everything out. Oh, you can't just wait until it's like... They've submitted stuff with some dependency graph. They might not have submitted the key to actually yeah. unlocking the whole thing yet. Oh, we yeah. don't know. It might be yeah, different. otherwise I was, like for the first problem, I, I think you could probably tackle it with some horror show called uh, RCU in user space. I've considered doing that. I, I think that that's like for the, for the, just the data structure punching out thing, like RCU in user space, is a thing that's going to happen or has already happened and <laughs> i mean it's terrible but I, but yeah is... it doesn't solve the the entire oh we, we've submitted half of our frame and the other frame is now stuck because we we call it the egl export extension there yeah. is an, op an option four or five we i don't think ever discussed uh which is to have quite a great deal of faith on in humanity, hope that no one ever tries this new GPU ancient user space, and then the first one who complains about it gets to fix it. Um, I am <laughs> so I am actually fairly favorable to that in the sense that my primary concern is that all the standard stuff keeps working. Um, making something bulletproof that prevents any possible corner case. I don't think is a constraint we should put on ourselves. Yeah, but well, the hmm. the ease with which you can construct horrible counterexamples using fairly reasonable looking comp combinations is quite annoying. Um, well, the past two surveys that of and the idea is that we, we change user space. Uh, Christian, I think you need to type. Like, you, yeah. you're a slideshow with Darth Vader overlay, and he's gone. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, Alex did float the exact same thing in the chat of minimum GPU requirements on compositors. It was followed by a winking face, but. I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the argument. It's just that there are, like, the, one of the counter examples that I came up with somewhere on that thread, all it required is a modern kernel driver and a USB display link device, which is a completely natural thing that people do all the time. It's called docking stations. And unless that display link driver is brought up to speed to be able to do all of the separate synchronization stuff, it just falls over. And like, yeah, if X11 is the only problem and my stupid X shem fence hack works, let's just do that. Like we can solve that problem. Um, but I'm all for that uh, V for L2 doesn't participate at all in implicit fencing. Um, I think I think VAPI is maybe the, the difficult one in that they, they surface DMA buffs and have no no concept of fencing. But yeah, if if we can actually use action fence, and again, I can't believe this is an actual viable solution, um, then we're just, I think we're just left with things like, yeah, GLCL interrupt, <clears throat> sorry, the GL Vulcan interrupt extensions as well, to be fair. Um, uh, GL and... Vulcan interrupt is solved. That uses, the, you true. have to do semaphores from GL. So true, true, we true, true, can true, make true. the GL thing, as long as GL uses the user space fences, that's solved. True, true, true. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, also, also VAPI, where it's definitely not anything like intractable. It's just a, a bunch of horrible typing. Uh, Christian oh. says, we can't assume Android will ever be fixed. I yeah, I wanted to say that too. Oh, oh, well, raise Christian's voice. Um, on the Vulcan thing, um, just another like really stupid idea that just crossed my mind. Uh, can we do a device last? Ooh, that's mean. Uh, well, so that's the mean part. But then we we store in the in the in the shader cache or wherever, like somewhere nasty, that this user or this desktop or whatever is unfortunately stuck in in like the last uh, millennia and never ever gets again like the user mode fence mode by default. Or this application, this this application, or something like that. So we just like we're sorry, we shot you. Oh, like please reconstruct everything, and we we make a note about like this exec or whatever from here or on out. Like it, it unfortunately runs in in DMA fence mode by default. So you you die once on startup the first time when all the shaders are getting compiled anyway. And. Uh if and Steam can ship this, with these quirks like from the default on, right? So it's it's mean and it's horrible and it makes more sense than it probably should. Um, could but, it like could it work? Like I don't care about mean. I, so, I mean that that is going to have to be our final terrible suggestion because we are banging against the top of the hour and they're about to start the closing keynote. Um, so on that, on that bombshell, um, we'll have to leave my here and drop out of this and, and continue on DRI develop for the next oblivion. three to four years, I'm sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Jason, Daniel, Christian, um, everyone else. Um, thanks for, for being here today and to the organizers or the, the sponsors as well. Um, yeah, this will all, all continue on. Um, and I'm sure we'll keep hearing more about it. Thank you very much. Thanks to you too. Cheers.